So uh, everyone, this is a tutorial for the embedding uh, one. We will start in 25 minutes. So you can feel free, just relax. And for the tutorial speaker, we are going to test to make sure everything works. Yes, Professor Han, I think you can uh, change your username because um, I currently I'm seeing your like ID instead of your name. Oh, I see. Yeah, you can just like um, hunt over your uh, ID and click um, more and you will have to see the re rename option. Okay, let me try it. Yeah, that's good. I, I can rename it. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm seeing the correct like uh, display. Okay. Yes, that's good. Uh, so then uh, I try to share the screen. Yeah, it seems to me I can share the screen now. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, we can see your screen. Okay. So. Uh, one thing is for the, the attendees, should we say where is the tutorial lecture slides? Um, it's in the job box, yeah. I, I know what I say is for the tutorial attendees. Oh, oh I see. So um, I post it on uh, our website and on um, that website uh, can be like linked from the KDD, like what, like the conference website. So they okay. should be able to access that. But I can also like post it in the, in our chat so that everybody um, who joins our uh, meeting can uh, okay. access our How you do slides. You should uh, post a topic on the Hova app so that uh, people can maybe people can uh, know that uh, know about our tutorial. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. So, Jashin, I, I, I kind of missed what you said. Oh, I mean, uh, do you think we should uh, post a topic on the Hova event uh, on the Hova app? On the Hova app. So how are we going to put the topics? So um, you mean um, kind of the outline or something? Yeah, I mean, just like, I'm not sure if there are any uh, uh, functions like posting a, a Twitter, I mean, something like that. Yeah, for the social media, they do have the whole app and uh, uh, I'm not sure how to post it on for our tutorial. Yeah, I have just post our like website to the chat box. I think you you should be able to access that. Okay. Yeah, I think it should be fine. Uh, people who are interested, in, uh, I'm not sure how they can access our tutorial. Uh, they must have some way to access it. It's on the web. Uh, do they have some particular one, say which room they want to go? I think they should have it. Yeah, I, I did not try it. Well, then maybe I can try to post a, you know, a post a, a topic on the Hova app so that yeah, people can uh, found our information, uh, found the information of our tutorial on the app. Yes. Yeah. So you go ahead and uh, do it. Okay. So we can. So you can see the. You can see my slides, right? Yes. Okay. That's good. Uh, and also, I think it's good when you speak, you turn your video on. So people should be able to see it. Okay. 
adjust my video camera. Yeah, yeah I think I'm, so, so currently I'm turning my video on. Yeah, I think at the very beginning when we just started, we mm -hmm. probably want to turn the video on uh, as a brief introduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can turn everything off if you think every, every uh, what I would suggest is uh, you, we can do the swapping on the changing of the screen, uh, changing the control. You, you, I, I stop my sharing, you can try your sharing. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. How it works. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm currently sharing my um, part three um, slides and I'm going to um, start um, playing from, so I'm not sure if you can uh, like yeah. see my presentation in full. I can see everything clearly. Okay, okay, okay. sure, great. So maybe uh, Jason can also try to share the screen. So do I really need to stop it or you can just take over? Likely you have to stop it, but you can, we can first try it. Based on my experiences, you have to first stop it. Other people can get on. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So Jashin, you can try yours. Yeah. And can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I can see your screen. You can put on the presentation mode, the okay. slideshow mode. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Works perfect. That's good. Okay. So I think in that case, we probably can stop. Uh, what I we will do is let me see. I see there's a one chat information. Hopefully it's not ours. Yeah, that's Iman's one on the tutorial. This one is your tu your whole tutorial, the whole set of slides. Mm. Oh yes, that's a, our tutorial one. So you put the slides also on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can see you You partition them into different parts. Mm -hmm. You'll put in the PDF or something? Yeah, I put in the PDF version. Okay, sure. That's good. Yeah, I think that should be good enough. Uh, we probably can, I would suggest we just get this uh, slides here as our presentation mode. Uh, when uh, it becomes the 8 p.m. Uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Mm -hmm. Start. Is that good? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. If you have particular music, you can bring. You can broadcast music. Whatever. Okay. Now we have 15 minutes to go. Mm, like 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, about 20 minutes, yeah. Assume the recording.
Okay, should we start now? I think we have uh, less than a minute, but uh, probably just wait until right mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. So this is a tutorial on embedding driven multi-dimensional topic mining and text analysis. Uh, the tutorial, we have uh, three speakers in the tutorial. The first one is Yu Meng. Uh, Yu is a PhD student at UIUC. Uh, he has done a lot of very innovative work. Uh, you probably will see uh, many, a lot of technical contents on this tutorial. Actually, it's based on his and uh, Jiaxin's, their joint work. Uh, published in New Rips 2019, in the Triple W 2020, and in uh, KDD 2020. Uh, actually, for 2020, uh, you know, Triple W and uh, and KDD, there are multiple papers they published on this. Uh, the the second speaker is Jiaxin Huang. She's also uh, PhD students, uh, PhD student in computer science, uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, so she also got lots of research papers. They all have, uh, even at the reasonably early stage of PhD, they already created lots of uh, you know, impactful work. So you will see their work and the tutorial notes on the overall overview on embedding driven uh, topic mining and text analysis. Uh, I myself, uh, Jiawei Han, is a professor at UIC. Uh, most people in the data mining community uh, know me, so I will not need further introduction. So this tutorial, we will uh, start using the set of slides. If you try to find the slides, you go to this tutorial website at KDD you see there are total six parts. Actually, the, the front one, the introduction is very short. And the major part is part one, part two, part three, and part four. Then we have a very brief summary. So during the tutorial, you can raise questions. Anything you are not uh, clear, you can raise questions. However, we, at the end of every part, we will leave about five minutes for question answering because uh, each section actually touching, touches many uh, research papers and different sections. They actually, they are somewhat separated. So it's better we do not need to wait until the very end to answer questions. So feel free, uh, prepare your questions. Uh, if you have something not clear enough, you want to raise right in the middle, feel free to raise questions right in the middle as well. Yeah, so, so I want to uh, mention a little bit that uh, to guarantee that our tutorial is of high quality and prevent some noises, we have um, disabled the um, audiences to um, mute themselves during our presentation. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put your questions in the chat box. And um, at the Q&A section, we will uh, allow audiences to unmute themselves so that we can um, have a real-time discussion. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, that's uh, definitely needed uh, because we, do, we did see you know, some noise at, uh, from different sites if we unmute everybody. Mm -hmm. So let's start. So since I have done the general introduction, I will not introduce the tutor. So we just start right uh, in the contents. Okay. So uh, if you look at why we want to give this topic, the motivation is very simple and clear. Is we are handling big data. We are doing data mining on a really, really huge uh, data set. However, if you check the data in the real world, you will find over 80% of big data 
actually are in the form of unstructured text data. Uh, for example, we get news, we get the research papers, uh, social media, and various kinds of documents. Even video and audio quite often they converse into some kind of a text form after some pre-processing as well. So the big data, actually the majority form is unstructured or semi-structured. The big data, the text data has one major challenge is it is very high dimensional. How can we uh, take this very high dimensional data to do uh, weekly supervised or distance supervised you know, data mining is a major challenge. So uh, how we can analyze or mine such big data systematically, we give you three keywords which actually penetrate this tutorial. One we call basic structuring. Basic structuring, we're not going to cover this in detail. I only cover very slightly in this tutorial. Is we consider the basic structuring is we grab the phrases, grab entities and relations, type them in some way. Uh, some people call this one as information extraction. Okay. Uh, in this tutorial, we're not going to discuss IE, information extraction to any extent, uh, but I'll give you just a very brief, uh, very, uh, brief introduction. Okay. Our tutorial is going to focus on the later two, one called embedding. That means we want to compute similarities among entities and relations, map them into relatively lower dimension space, so we can handle them in a in a some, you know, ex intelligent smart way. And uh, another one is advanced structuring. That means besides we can structure them into entity relations and type them. We want to discover hierarchies, taxonomies, and explore uh, the data in the multi-dimensional space. So that embedding and advanced structuring is the theme in this tutorial. Okay. So the first thing we should say is the text actually is in multi-dimensional in nature. For example, if you just look at this uh, simple uh, text, what you can see is you get lots of things about the products, about the brands, about the aspects, about years. You can grab them from a different dimension space and link them, analyze them. And for basic structuring, uh, we mainly consider phrase mining and information extraction as a way to do basic structuring. For example, this is one we use auto phrase or sec phrase. Go down, this actually was reported by Chip Advisor. They send us their internal discussion, okay, on how they use our sec phrase. So you probably can see you can automatically, or with some minimal supervision, for example, using Wikipedia, those supervision, you can grab the phrases in some meaningful way and cluster them. And then you can analyze, for example, the hotels. Okay. Another important thing is doing automated name entity extraction. Okay, we call NER or name entity recognition in, you know, like a natural language processing field. So this one just shows using our NER tools, automated NER, simply says, uh, you only need the general dictionary or some human provided small dictionary. Then you can go through, for example, this one is the PubMed uh, data. We go through the biomedical literature, try to find the COVID-19 related the types. So this is just a randomly we pick up one you know, paragraph, and you probably can see, you can find it, you can automatically recognize genes or genome or chemical or evolution, wildlife, uh, even physical science or disease or syndromes. That processing will help people to further, you know, explore using various kinds of data mining or text mining or natural language processing tools. 
So this is we call basic structure. Then in this lecture, we are going to discuss more on the embedding power. This one just showing you one research paper we discussed about text embedding. That means how we can use weak supervision. For example, you can supervise by giving, say, I'm interested in politics versus science versus literature, or the other people say, I'm interested in like different countries, like England versus the United States. You probably see the six names. Uh, if you have different emphasis by user given category, you actually get different kinds of embeddings. That's probably people really like because in the real analysis, it's not like one size fits all. You need user guidance to give you different focus. Then you get different kinds of embeddings to facilitate your analysis. And also we can do automated taxonomy generation. So this one is about uh, DBRP, how to do this. And overall picture, what we can think could be this. Starting from hex corpus incorporated with distance supervision by existing knowledge base like a Wikipedia or biomedical dictionaries, we can first do weak structuring, doing phrase mining and entity recognition. Then we feed them into text embedding. With text embedding, we can work out taxonomies. We can work out topics. With this, we will be able to do multi-dimensional text analysis to derive structure knowledge. So this is our roadmap, how to conquer unstructured massive data sets like text data. So here we show there are lots of applications we're going to introduce you in this tutorial as well. This is about automated paper categorization or classification. And this is about the trend analysis. This is about a comparative summarization. So the whole tutorial, we are going to partition them into four major parts. The part one is on text embedding. Part two is on taxonomy construction. Part three is on user-guided topic mining. Part four is on multi-dimensional text analysis. Uh, for the tutorial arrangement, we are going to first have part, parts one and two before our break. Then we plan to have 40 minutes break because total we allocated four hours tutorial. We want to have a 40 minutes break. Then we start on part three and part four. So hopefully we can finish say 20 minutes earlier. So our total lecture hours will be three hours. So, but in the middle, we think you, you need a break, the speaker need a break. So we get 40 minutes break in the middle. Okay. So if you look at the arrangement, you probably can see the part one, part two uh, in our whole roadmap is part of it. Then we get into part three and part four um, after the break. So I think for this part, I'm not going to say we kick out a five minutes uh, discussion because it's very general, very simple, high level, okay? So now I stop my sharing. I will pass this one to Yu Man. Yu mm -hmm. is going to share the screen, is going to uh, discuss the technical detail on R1. Yeah, so I, I believe uh, you can see my screen right now. Okay, um, so uh, thanks uh, for Pro Professor Han's uh, general introduction of our tutorial. And um, I will be del delivering our uh, first part, uh, first major part of our contents called Overview of Tax Embedding Methods. And my name is Yu, I'm from a UIUC, a PhD student. Um, so in this part, I will be giving you um, introduction of um, the development of tax embedding methods. So first I will give you a brief introduction to um, tax embeddings and then we will um, review the local context based board embeddings uh, like word to vac law of these kind of uh, classic embedding frameworks. And then we will proceed to on um, the joint local and global context based tax embeddings. And then we will introduce the recently popular deep contextualized embeddings from the newer language models. 
And finally, we will discuss the possibility of extending N-suppressed embeddings to incorporate weak supervisions um, that we do not want the that we uh, want the human to uh, guide our embedding learning while uh, do not need to provide that much um, annotation efforts. So um, firstly, I would like to give you a brief introduction to the text embedding um, literature. So um, text embeddings are a milestone in natural language processing and machine learning. So text embedding is a form of enterprise learning of text representations, which means that um, the text uh, embeddings are, are trained on large amount of natural language text and there is no human supervision needed. And the general idea of text embedding is we want to embed each word into a lower dimensional vector space. And in this vector, uh, in this vector space, distributed representations of words are learned to uh, effectively capture their semantics. And this addresses the curse of dimensionality. And there are a lot of uh, useful properties of word semantics um, that are captured by the word embedding learning process. So firstly, um, the word similarity is reflected in this distributed representation space. So basically, um, as you can see in the bottom left figure, the words with similar meanings are embedded closer to reflect their textual semantics. And also, um, there are some linear relationships captured between words um, by this embedding space. So for example, when you take uh, the vector representation of king minus queen, you can get approximately equal to um, the vector space subtraction of men um, subtracted by women. Um, so the applications of text embedding um, cover a lot of um, a wide spectrum of downstream tasks. For example, we can use um, text embeddings to perform word token or entity level tasks. For example, we can um, use the text embeddings to uh, compute word similarities for keyword extraction or uh, clustering. And also we can do taxonomy construction like shown on the bottom left figure. So um, in this taxonomy, each node is represented by an entity or phrases. And these phrases or entities are uh, represented by the embedding vectors. And also we can use um, the word embeddings as the input features to a lot of document or paragraph level tasks. For example, we can use um, as shown on the bottom right figure, uh, we can have this uh, word vectors as the input features to a document classifier. And also um, this can be extended to clustering, retrieval, question answering and summarization. Okay, so um, next we will uh, introduce several um, very classic and popular um, word embedding um, and also the very early uh, stage of like word embeddings and they are based on the local context. So we call them local context based word embeddings. And firstly, they are proposed in the Euclidean space like word to vac glove and fast text. And then um, some studies extend them to the hyperbolic space for specific purposes and we will introduce them in details later. Okay, so first let's take a look at um, the word to vac model. So the basic idea of word to vac model is to use local context to model the word semantics. So the words that share um, similar local context are pushed together in the distributed representation space. And this is accomplished by developing a predictive model. And this predictive model basically maximizes the probability of observing a center word based on its local context. So here on um, this objective shows the predictive model. Um, we can predict the center word based on um, its local context. And here the local context window refers to uh, several words, um, L words, uh, for example, L is used, uh, usually used uh, as, uh, usually set to be five or 10 or so. So basically this forms a local context window surrounding the um, center word. So we use each uh, word in the local context window of a center word to predict itself. And so after we train this predictive model, um, <clears throat> the resulting embedding uh, space will have um, the favorable property of semantically coherent or similar terms um, will be more likely to have um, similar or close embeddings. Okay, so now we get into another um, local context space Euclidean uh, embedding model called GLOF. And the general idea of GLOF is to use 
uh, matrix factorization style learning to um, solve a least squares problem to recover the original word count hex matrix. So how is this word count hex matrix formed? So basically the rows are words and the columns are count hex. So here the count hex still refers to local count hex. So a word can have a fixed length local count hex and we collect its local count hex words on the column of it. So basically we want the learned word embeddings to reflect or to recover its uh, original corpus statistics. So um, we accomplished this by designing this objective to um, solve the least square problem to recover the original uh, sparse high dimensional uh, matrix into um, this low dimensional word representation matrix as well as um, this context uh, feature matrix. Okay, so um, now we get into the, the third uh, line of um, local context based embedding learning framework called FastTax. And the general idea of FastTax is very similar to word to vec but the FastTax uh, model improves upon the word to vec model by incorporating subword information. So this subword information refers to character engrams. So for example, we have a full word where. We can do character engram or trigram extraction by splitting it into several parts. And these several parts will have different subword representations. And the whole word representation is aggregated from their character engrams. So in this way, we can um, account for the subword uh, representations across different full words so that um, when two words share uh, similar subword structures, they will likely share similar uh, word embeddings. And again, this is a uh, simply modification of the word to vac predictive model by uh, switching this um, dot product structure into um, the summation of uh, character engram embeddings. Okay, so now uh, we have finished introduced uh, the three very classic and popular Euclidean space, local contact space word embeddings. And now we get into um, the hyperbolic space model called Poincaré embeddings. So um, before introducing the details, um, we might wonder why uh, Euclidean embedding space is not enough. Why do we want non-Euclidean embedding space? So the reason is that sometimes textual data can have specific structures um, that is, is hard to uh, be captured by the Euclidean space models. So um, what is good about the hyperbolic space is that the hyperbolic space is a naturally continuous version of trees because um, the distances in this hyperbolic space is unlike the Euclidean space where the distances are, are just uniformly distributed over the entire space. Well, in this hyperbolic space, um, the entire space is defined within a unit ball. And um, the uh, hyperbolic distance is closer to the origin of this, hyper, uh, of this space um, has lower distances. Well, um, the hyperbolic distances closer to the boundary of this ball uh, has extremely large um, hyperbolic distances. So um, this kind of um, distance variance naturally uh, equip the model with um, the ability of modeling the hierarchical structures like trees. For example, we can put a very general terms like entity or something at the origin of this uh, space. And then we can put some leaf nodes like very sp specific terms uh, at the boundary of this uh, hyperbolic space so that this uh, resulting model will ref correctly reflect um, the tree structure of uh, the hierarchy. So, okay, let's take a look at how this Poincaré embedding is learned. So the general idea is basically to put general terms um, at the origin and specific terms to be at the boundary. So basically we use this um, objective to achieve this. And this objective is generally used um, in the original Poincaré embedding to model an existing hierarchical structure. For example, we can take the word net and embed the word net into this hyperbolic space. But you might wonder um, when it comes to um, the unstructured text because the unstructured text do not explicitly exhibit a hierarchy. So the hierarchy is latent, basically is not observed. So how are we going to embed the unstructured text into this hyperbolic space? So here comes the idea of Poincaré glove. So um, basically this is an extension of the original glove model into the hyperbolic space. And the motivation being that um, there are some latent hierarchical structures in the unstructured, in the unlabeled or unstructured text. For example, we can have hyperneme and hyponym pairs. 
And also we can potentially have textual entombments between different sentences. So what we're going to do is to replace this uh, Euclidean kernel with a hyperbolic kernel so that we can use a Poincaré uh, ball model to uh, learn the text embeddings. So originally uh, in the glob model, um, the kernel is characterized by the Euclidean dot pro uh, vector dot product. And then we switch to the hyperbolic metric to basically we use a hyper hyperbolic kernel. And the good thing about the learned embedding is that they exhibit um, so-called generality or specificity of the text. So for example, here we show four case study fi uh, figures. And on the y-axis, um, it goes from specific to general. So if we sort um, these terms uh, from according to the variance, basically we can see that these terms exhibit a hierarchical structure. We can have the general terms like president at the top and we can have specific president names at the bottom. So these naturally forms a um, tree structure. Okay, so um, all the previous uh, embedding based uh, frameworks are based on local context. So basically they define the word semantics by modeling the local context of words. So now we get into um, another framework uh, which models the joint uh, local context and global context to define the textual uh, semantics. Because the document or paragraph uh, embeddings are jointly learned in this process, we call it text embeddings instead of just word embeddings. And this is our own framework called JOS, which is defined in the spherical space. So um, before introducing the spherical space model, we might wonder um, why we want to come up with this spherical embedding. So that is based on an empirical like uh, finding of how the properties of word semantics is captured by this vector space model. So um, some of you might know that word similarity is usually divided using the directional similarity or the cosine angle similarity. For example, when we want to compare uh, the, sem the semantic similarity of two words like France and Italy, we use their cosine vector space cosine similarities. So if they have very similar meanings, they will, you can expect them to have a very high cosine similarity. Well, if you take two um, unrelated words, you can expect their cosine similarity to be closer to each zero. And if you take two opposite meaning like directions or semantics, you can expect their vector um, space model to have uh, negative cosine similarities. So this is saying that what actually matters in similarity co uh, computation is the angle or is the directional similarity, not the vector norm. And another motivation is that um, we can do clustering when we uh, learn the document representations. And when we do the clustering, we can use k-means or spherical k-means. Uh, and, and if you don't know, uh, if, if you are not familiar with spherical k-means, it's just an extension of k-means to um, the surface of the sp of sphere. So when we do the spherical k-means, we usually observe better uh, performance of the document clustering results than using the classic uh, k-means. So um, this empirical evidence all, all suggests that the vector direction uh, in this embedding space is what actually matters and we want to get rid of the impact of vector norms. So uh, if this is true, what will be the issues um, with the previous word embedding learning frameworks? As we introduced before, the word to vac glove and fast text models, they are all trained in the Euclidean space. So this creates a gap between the training space and the usage, usage space. So during training, we are uh, training our model in the Euclidean space like this. And after that, we are doing a post-processing. Basically, we're normalizing um, the vector norms so that uh, all the vectors reside on a unit ball. So here is a discrepancy because we have to do this post-processing. So you might wonder, why do we care about this inconsistency or discrepancy? The reason is that in this way, the objective during training that we optimize is not really the one we use um, during the usage space. So um, let's take a look at this uh, three models. In the word to vac glove and fast text, they model the word similarity by um, Euclidean vector dot product. So basically what we're optimizing is this embedding uh, Euclidean dot product. But what we are really using uh, them in the applications is we are using their cosine similarity, ignoring their norms. And we would like to give you a, a very concrete example to show that 
the discrepancy uh, of between training and usage can be harmful. So let's consider two pairs of words. The first pair being lover quarrel, and the second pair being rock jazz. And from the human per, uh, point of view, pair B should be um, more similar than pair A because they are uh, all type of music. And indeed, their ground truth similarity is pair A has lower um, similarity than pair B in a benchmark test set. But let's take a look at how word to vec assigns um, the word semantic similarities. When we compute the dot product, which is what we optimize for training, it actually do this correctly because um, the pair B has a higher Euclidean dot product. But when we do um, the post-processing by normalizing their vectors, um, we are using their cosine similarity essentially. The relationship changes. So basically uh, now the pair A has a higher cosine similarity than pair B, which is incorrect. So you, you, you can see from this simple example that it's harmful to have this inconsistency or dependence, uh, discrepancy between uh, training and usage. And this is the first issue with the previous embedding learning framework. And the second issue is with respect to how um, the contacts are defined. So previously, um, we learned embedding, we, uh, we used the local context to learn um, the word semantics. So basically, we are looking at uh, several words before this, tar uh, this target word and several words after it. But in this very simple example, suppose we are learning the semantics for the center word or target word harmful. If we only take a look at um, its local context, it's very hard to recognize its uh, correct meaning. Well, if we um, extend our scope to um, the paragraph level or document level, we can observe a lot of uh, similar meaning words like taunting, alarm, shot. These are all negative meaning words. So if we observe these, we can easily guess that this center word is very likely to have a negative meaning. So this is saying that local context can only partly define the word semantics and we want to take consideration into, uh, we want to take the global concept uh, context into consideration. And this global context can refer to paragraphs or documents. Okay, so uh, motivated by the previous two issues, we are proposing this spherical text embedding framework. And this framework is published in um, last year's New York's conference. And this spherical text embedding uh, framework is um, des designed as a generative model on the sphere. So um, this follows exactly how humans uh, write articles. So we first, uh, when we write articles, we first have a very general idea of what the paragraph or the document is, is going to talk about. And then we write down each word to make sure that they're consistent with the semantics of the paragraph or the document. So here comes a two-step generation process. So firstly, we have this document or paragraph, and we model their semantics via a document vector D or paragraph uh, vector. And then condition on the document or paragraph, we generate the center word according to the exponential over its cosine similarity. And after that, we want to make sure that the local context can uh, be consistent with the center word. So basically, we condition on the center word to generate its surrounding word as context. And again, we define this probability using the exponential over the directional similarity. Okay, so in the spherical space, uh, we, need to specific, we need to specify their uh, probability expressions. And we proved the, this theorem showing that this um, exponential over directional similarity on the, defined on the spherical space is exactly the VMF distribution. So um, when we do the generation process, we are relying on the VMF distribution. And here is a graphic illustration of uh, understanding the, our spherical generative model. So uh, in a nutshell, our, uh, generative, our generative process is a two-step one. In the first step, we use the global context to generate the center word semantics. So assuming we have a computer graphics document and we have a vector to represent the document or the paragraph semantic, and we want to condition on this general global context vector to generate each center word semantics. And this uh, generation probability is dis described by the VMF distribution. And in the second step, we are <clears throat> guaranteeing that the local context is inconsistent with the center word semantics. So we condition on the center word direction to generate its surrounding words. And now we arrive at our training objective. 
So the final generation probability is the multiplication of uh, the two-step generation. Basically, both are described by the VMF distribution. And our, our training objective uh, is obtained by maximizing the probability of a real co-occurred tuple. And we want to rank that uh, cosine similarity to be higher than a negative sample. So you might observe that um, this very final uh, training objective is actually very elegant because we don't have any exponential terms or logarithm terms. These are nonlinear terms. Well, we only have this cosine terms which characterizes the directional similarity in the vector space model. And this cosine similarity, if defined on the sphere, is exactly equal to or equivalent to the embedding dot product because their vector norms are always equal to one. And this is a very good thing because um, our objective like this is totally linear. And the gradient of that is very, can be very easily computed. So when we talk about optimization to train our embedding vectors, we rely on the Riemannian optimization procedure because we want to make sure that um, the parameters or the vectors are always updated on the sphere uh, on the surface of the sphere. And we apply this Riemannian optimization procedure to uh, optimize our spherical vectors. And also we want to make sure that the directional similarity is um, explicitly incorporated in the training process. So basically we multiply, by, um, we multiply this uh, great, uh, Euclidean gradient by the angular distances uh, between um, the current point and the target point. And now we're ready to see some results. So the first set of results is conducted, conducted on the word similarity benchmarks. So we compare with the previous Euclidean models as well as the Poincaré models. And we show that our spherical model achieves the best result. And this indeed verifies our hypothesis that the vector space, um, the directional similarity in the vector space is what actually needed um, by the word semantic tasks. So you might wonder why this very famous and popular, uh, recently popular BERT model fall behind other uh, baselines on this evaluation. Um, we guess that, um, that there are two reasons. The first reason is that in BERT model, we learn contextualized representations, and I will introduce that later. But this word similarity evaluation is conducted in a context-free manner. Basically, we're taking two words and compare their general uh, similarity in terms of um, contact uh, in terms of semantics. And secondly, BERT is optimized on specific pre-training tasks like mask language model prediction and next sentence prediction. And these pre-training tasks are not directly related to modeling word similarities. And the second um, set of experiments is conducted on document clustering. And here we compare with a set of document representation uh, baselines. And we use two clustering algorithms, um, the traditional k-means and the spherical k-means, which uh, normalizes the embedding vectors. And we observe that um, the embedding quality is generally more important than the clustering algorithms because um, when we change the uh, clustering algorithms from k-means to spherical k-means, it only gives us very marginal performance boost. But when we use this spherical um, embedding as the feature for clustering, we actually have always the optimal like, performance regardless of the, uh, whether a k-means or spherical k-means is used. And uh, in terms of training efficiency, our model JOS is very efficient, actually outperforming all the previous embedding models. So why is our model training efficient? As we mentioned before, our model's objective only contain uh, only contains linear terms, which is the cosine similarity terms and equivalent to embedding dot products on the spherical space. But the previous word to vac law and fast tax, these models uh, all contain uh, nonlinear terms, uh, operations like exponential functions or logarithm functions, not to mention this BERT model, which is very deep and there are a lot of neural network nonlinear operations. So our model enjoys the highest efficiency when trained on the latest Wikipedia dump. So, okay, so previously we have introduced um, all these uh, context-free embeddings. Uh, they either capture local contacts or jointly consider local and global contacts. And now we get into the deep contextualized embeddings from the newer language models. So the motivation of, of um, proposing contextualized embedding is that context-free embedding will, only, will always use one fixed representation regardless of the specific context of the word. So for example, when we have a polysemy like bank, 
and it can appear in different contexts with different semantics, like open a bank account or on the riverbank. Obviously, they have different semantics, but context-free embeddings will represent both words with the same representation, despite they have um, different meanings. So the good thing about deep neural language models is that they overcome this problem by learning contextualized word semantics. So how do we do this? We introduced the first framework called ELMO. And this, in this ELMO model, we use um, multiple LSTM models to um, form a deep neural model to learn, um, to model the language uh, left to right dependency and right to left dependency. So basically here, we're uh, constructing two sets of LSTMs. The first, the first set of LSTMs captures the left to right context, while the second set of LSTMs captures the right to left context. And uh, at the very final layer, they are concatenated to form um, the final contextualized representations. Um, but the limitations of the ELMO model is that <clears throat> this model is not actually deeply bidirectional. The reason is that um, we don't uh, leverage the bidirectional information until the very last layer because um, we only concatenate the bidirectional information uh, at the very top of these layers. So how do we make the model deeply bidirectional? So here comes the BERT model. So the BERT model introduces a novel mask language model for training task to overcome this um, shallow bidirectionality uh, in the ELMO paper. And <clears throat> the mask language model uh, pre-training task is basically randomly masking out 15% uh, of the words in the sequence so that um, the bidirectional information can be uh, jointly modeled to predict the masked word. And the reason why we mask out word is that um, the word cannot be seen by uh, the, further, the further or the deeper layers in this model. And when we take a deeper look at the architecture in this BERT model, it actually uses the transformer encoder. So this tra transformer encoder employs a self-attention mechanism. So this self-attention mechanism basically learns the contextual relationships between the words and also subwords in the textual sequence to derive the representation for each token. And also BERT introduces a next sentence prediction task. And this task basically takes a pairs a pair of sentences, and it learns to predict whether the second sentence of the pair is the valid subsequent sentence of the first sentence. And next, we introduce several variants of the BERT model that improves over it. So the first model is called the Roberta model. And in the Roberta model, there are several very simple multiplications proposed that make BERT more effective. So the first thing is they train the model for longer with bigger batches over more data. So as we can see here, the original BERT model is only trained on 16 gigabytes, while the Roberta model is trained on 160 gigabytes. And also the Roberta model removes the next sentence prediction objective because it shows that it's not that effective. And also Roberta is trained on longer sequences closer to five, uh, 512 tokens. And also Roberta dy dynamically changes the masking patterns instead of using always fixed ma masking like configurations like in BERT. And another um, framework that improves over uh, the BERT model is called Albert, but Albert mainly focus on the efficiency side. So there are two um, like uh, bullet points that improves the efficiency of model. So firstly, they reduce the, the context-free embedding used in the very first layer. So basically in the uh, token embedding, um, the Albert uses a lower dimensional token embedding and then project them to the higher dimension uh, embedding space to match the hidden layer dimension sites. And secondly, um, Albert allows cross-layer parameter sharing. So basically we when we have 12 layers of transformers, we can allow them to share the feed-forward uh, network parameters and the attention parameters. And, sec and thirdly, the Albert will um, have a inter-sentence uh, coherence loss, and this is basically formed by um, changing the next sentence prediction task to sentence order prediction. So basically, sentence order prediction takes um, two sentences and randomly permutes them, and the model needs to predict which one is first and which one is second. And next we get into uh, another line of 
uh, language modeling uh, framework called XLNet. And this XLNet is an autoregressive language modeling similar to ELMO. And this is motivated by the issues with BERT because BERT creates, uh, creates mask tokens. And these mask tokens are predicted independently, which, say, which, uh, which means that when we have a token mask, when we want to predict it, it cannot see other mask tokens, which breaks the conditional uh, probability distribution. And also the artificial mask token introduced brings discrepancy between the pre-training stage and fine-tuning stage because in the fine-tuning stage, we will never see a mask token. So motivated by these issues, the XLNet model uses a permutation language modeling to overcome these um, two issues. So um, to leverage the bi-directional context, the XLNet basically permutes the text sequences and um, predict the target word using the remaining word in the sequence. Because um, the original text sequence is randomly permute, um, we can, in principle, leverage both forward direction information and backward directional information. But we also want to keep in mind that when the original sequence is permuted, we want to make sure that it's still a semantically uh, plausible sequence. So we, want to, we don't really want to um, like permute its real sequence, but we want to um, do a different factorization uh, order. And this different factorization order is accomplished by the configuration in the attention masks. So basically, the XLNet model uses a so-called two-stream self-attention uh, architecture. And this two-stream self-attention uh, um, a strategy is motivated by um, the fact that each token can play two roles um, during language modeling. So the first role is that each token can be the target token to be predicted. And the second role is that each token can act as the context to predict other tokens. So um, this is saying that uh, each token has two roles and we need to derive two representations for them. So the first representation is called content representation in the content, uh, in the content stream attention. And we have a query representation for the query stream uh, attention. So the difference being that in the query representation, the model cannot see the token content. And this is true when we want to predict the token itself, because when we want to predict the content in the token, we absolutely cannot see its content. We only uh, encode its position. Well, when we want to predict other tokens, we can absolutely take this token's content into consideration. So in the content representation, we do want to incorporate this token's content. So in the content stream, uh, the token can see itself. Well, in the query stream, when we want to predict the token's identity, we want to make sure that the model is, allowed, is not allowed to see uh, the target content. Okay, so the final model we are going to introduce is called Electro, and Electro introduces a pretty new or pretty um, different like um, language modeling task uh, from the previous uh, frameworks called replacement token detection. And this replacement token detection is conducted in the following way. Suppose we have two models, a generator and a discriminator. And the generator is uh, a traditional mass language model like a BERT, but it's a smaller one. And we feed the original sequence with 15% uh, of portion, proportion masked out to this generator. And this generator would uh, generate plausible replacement for uh, these masked tokens. And the task of the discriminator is to um, classify whether or not each token of the um, input sequence is original or replaced. So um, the efficiency of Electro comes from the fact that the replacement token detection is trained on old tokens instead of only those tokens that are masked. And this is uh, what the previous models um, falls inefficient on. And uh, another point that this Electro model is made more efficient is because of uh, the generator used in this uh, mask language modeling uh, objective is pretty small. The parameter size is uh, around 10% of the discriminator. And also the discriminator is trained on a binary classification task, which is the replacement token det detection, um, which requires much less computation resource than mask language model, because mask language model is basically classification over the entire vocabulary. Okay, so um, the electron model actually achieves the current state-of-the-art blue results um, with the same compute, so it's actually very efficient. Okay, so we have finished introducing uh, the previous lines of, um, of, of 
uh, different uh, tax embedding frameworks. But we want to keep in mind that the previous introduced embedding frameworks are all unsupervised or self-supervised. They cannot or um, they can't um, incorporate user supervision. But sometimes we do want to uh, let the user guide the embedding learning process. So um, why do we want to incorporate user supervision? Because the unsupervised word embeddings are always the generic word representations. They do not have any task specific information. So uh, we cannot expect them to yield the, to yield the best performance on the downstream tasks. And of course we can tune uh, the embeddings with uh, downstream task uh, training signals. But sometimes we do not want to, um, we want to reduce the human efforts, uh, annotation efforts. So we want to provide some weak supervision. So in the part three, we will talk about how to adapt these unsupervised or self-supervised embeddings to weekly supervised embeddings in order to cater to different user um, like purposes for uh, downstream tasks. And here we only show a very simple case to illustrate uh, the, the limitations of unsupervised embeddings. So assume we have good and bad and we retrieve the most similar words with them. And we can see that um, actually these two antonym has, uh, has a lot of overlapping similar words, which means that they are not fully distinctive from each other. So we will introduce how to overcome this uh, in the third part. And this basically concludes uh, our, my our first part introduction. And uh, I think we can uh, get into the Q&A session. So I think there are several uh, questions in the chat, in the chat box. Uh, not sure whether you can access the chat box. Yeah, yeah, currently I can see the chat box. Yeah, maybe I'm not sure whether others you can, you can, uh, let me see. You are sharing screen, right? You uh, so I, I have stopped screen sharing. Okay. Uh, maybe we can, you can look at the chat box. Can, is anybody see the, uh, maybe? Yeah, so we also like allow the, the audiences to unmute themselves. So uh, this is time for you to um, speak out if you want to uh, raise questions. So first, let me answer the first question uh, regarding um, how to train the model, right? So um, I saw a question called, where did you uh, do the training on? Were these uh, um, the commodity machines or GPUs distributed or single mode training? Okay, so um, for the context-free embeddings like Word2Vec, uh, GLOV, like um, these kind of uh, shallow, very shallow models, uh, including our uh, spherical text embedding models, they can be uh, simply trained on a multi-CPU like uh, machines and CPUs will be um, typically enough for um, training these shallow uh, models. But for a more like a newer language model, like more complicated, more sophisticated models like BERT, Axelnet, these kind of models, we do want to make sure that we have the GPUs and it will be extremely slow to train on CPUs. So, um, you, uh, so according to my like understanding, if you want to train a BERT model, you have to use some distributed like uh, strategy to train it because um, if you want to uh, train, for example, the model within one week, you might need at least like eight GPUs or 10 GPUs or so. So we want to like make sure that the model is trained in parallel. Um, okay, so um, the next question being on the electrical efficiency over um, over other models. Okay, so this is actually a good question because uh, from the first glance, the electro model may, might have a very similar uh, formulation with the GAN model because it has a generator and a discriminator. But actually, um, this is not very um, like formulated in an advers adversarial training way because in, in GAN, you're basically uh, training the generator to fool the discriminator so that they are uh, the training scheme is uh, in general an adversarial like strategy. But uh, in Electra, um, the generator is actually trained uh, in completely independently from the discriminator. So you can imagine the generator to be 
a very traditional, a very conventional, um, like a BERT model, which is trained uh, via the mass language model uh, objective. So basically the generator is not trained to fool the discriminator and um, all the computation like resources you pay is to train basically a smaller scale like uh, BERT model. So which, which is not like very heavy. And also talking about the discriminator part, the discriminator actually uses a much simpler like uh, classification task because it only needs to classify uh, whether or not each token is real or fake. Um, it does not need to like classify over the entire vocabulary. So um, this is actually more efficient than um, the original uh, BERT model in terms of, um, okay, let me come back to, let me figure out how to uh, come back to the, um, to the Electra slides. Um, You can still use the sharing mode, yes. Yeah. I can see it. Yeah, so this part is basically the how the dis, the discriminator is trained. So basically we use this um, replacement, replacement token detection task, which is only a binary classification task. So uh, overall, this is a very like um, efficient training uh, scheme uh, without any like adversarial like uh, training strategy. Okay, so I'm going to look at the Sammy. next. Okay, so the next question is uh, about the document embedding. Yeah, so it's very, um, it's very like uh, common to see that some uh, paper uses the average of word vectors to form the document embedding, um, but sometimes um, it's not enough because um, the, the word vectors are um, basically um, are basically like a, t a given like uniform like weighting to form the document embedding. And in our model, we are basically uh, assuming a generative uh, relationship between the document embedding and the word embedding. So basically this is a two-step generation like process. And we allow uh, the model to model the um, document embedding as the general semantics of the paragraph or the document. So that uh, when we have the general semantics, we can uh, generate each like center word semantics according to uh, inconsistent with the uh, like document like uh, general semantics. Um, yeah, so the next is how could we interpret the dimensions of uh, embedding BERT or word to vec could we find the semantic precisely for one particular dimension? Okay, so in general, the embedding, the word, the text embedding like dimensions are uh, not interpretable by humans because um, they are distributed representations and uh, they are basically taken as a whole to form uh, the uh, semantics uh, to to reflect the semantics of the words or text. And if we took uh, if we take a look at specific dimensions, it's very hard to like really interpret whether that represents, for example, color or that represents the shape or the size or it has semantic representation or syntactic representation. Um, but I do uh, like uh, saw some frameworks to uh, do some dimension reduction to extract a sub like a set of the dimensions to um, reflect a specific a subset of features. For example, when we only care about syntactic features or semantic features, we can do the dimension reduction to extract a subset of them. Um, okay, so I think there are like three other questions, but I think we can like uh, do the next part's presentation while I answer them in the chat box so that we won't like have too uh, much time uh, spent on this Q&A session. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that's fine. Uh, I know there are lots of very interesting questions. Maybe we can uh, at the first you know, you can answer them in the chat box. Mm -hmm. if we got a sufficient interest, we can re-raise it at the very end of the tutorial. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's sure. good. Mm -hmm. So then we get into part two. I think part two, uh, Jiaxin is going to present it. So we were uh, all uh, keep silent. I know there are some strange uh, beat, but we haven't been able to figure out the reason. So just to make sure you yourself do not click something randomly. 
uh, but we mute everybody. We do not know where the the mute is, where those sounds came from. But just uh, bearing with it. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. This is Jiaxing, and I will be delivering the part two, multifaceted taxonomy construction. So this will be a prerequisite for our multidimensional topic mining and tax analysis because it will structure uh, the tax data into a hierarchical structure. So basically our outline of this part will be, we will first introduce taxonomy basics, and then we decompose the taxonomy construction into three steps, entity set expansion, taxonomy construction from scratch, and taxonomy expansion. So what is a taxonomy? It's basically a hierarchical organization of concepts. And we have listed uh, several examples of uh, the typical taxonomy in our life, uh, in our daily life, such as Wikipedia category. Uh, and this MASH stands for medical subject heading, which is a taxonomy of medical diseases. And here is Amazon product category, which is a, an example of the product, taxon product taxonomy on the e-commerce platform. And also this word net is a taxonomy of words in, in a language. So why do we need a taxonomy? Basically, it is a hierarchical summary of the concepts. And if we have the taxonomy, we can perform, uh, we can structure the tax data by hierarchical document categorization. And after that, we can perform downstream applications like text analysis, knowledge organization, and recommender system. So there are in general two types of taxonomy. The first one is classroom-based taxonomy. So actually, the, uh, in the classroom-based taxonomy, we have uh, and the no each node is represented by a cluster of terms. So this is good for people to comprehend the concept. And the other one is instance-based taxonomy. So basically, uh, each node will be represented by a single term. And uh, there are some limitations of the existing taxonomy as we have uh, shown in the previous slides. They are all generic taxonomy with fixed is a relation between nodes. So they fail to adapt to user specific interest in special areas by dominating the hierarchical structure of irrelevant terms. And our research focus is on multifaceted taxonomy. One facet only reflects a certain kind of relation between parent and child nodes in a user interested field. For example, uh, we, have, uh, we have given an example of uh, the user uh, is interested in the subfield relation in a DBLP corpus, then the ideal output of the algorithm could be uh, the root is the computer science node and the second layer are some subfields in the computer science. And for each node, there are several, there, are, there is a set of representative and discriminative topical words to describe the node. And on the other hand, uh, another facet could be the location taxonomy. So in the first layer, there could be many country names. And in the second layer, there are many states and provinces of corresponding countries. So in general, there are two stages in constructing a complete taxonomy. The first is taxonomy construction from scratch. That means our input is a set of entities or possibly a seed taxonomy in a small scale and unstructured tax data to build a taxonomy organized by certain relations. And the second, uh, the second stage is taxonomy expansion. Uh, so that means we update an already constructed large scale taxonomy by attaching new items to a suitable node on the existing taxonomy. This step is very useful uh, when the reconstructing a new taxonomy from scratch can be resource consuming. So we will decompose the taxonomy. Uh, we will first look into the flat ver version of the taxonomy construction, which is the parallel concept expansion. So basically, if we want to gradually expand a complete hierarchical structure, it can be decomposed into two subtasks. The first one is the flat version one, which is parallel concept expansion. So as you can look in this figure, 
if we want to uh, grow this hierarchical tree, then the first thing we can do is to uh, expand the concepts in each layer gradually. So uh, we call this uh, one and uh, concept expansion or entity set expansion. So then after this flat version one, uh, we will go to the second stage of uh, taxonomy construction as a hierarchical version to capture user interested relations. Okay, so now we will look at our uh, flat version, the entity set expansion, and these are several related works that we're going to introduce to you. So basically, let's first look at the definition of corpus based set expansion. Uh, it means that we uh, want to find the complete set of entities belonging to the same semantic class based on a given corpus and a tiny set of seats. So the first example uh, gives us, uh, so uh, uh, these are the seats given from users, like Illinois, Maryland, then we want to derive all US states. And in the second example, the user gives us a field, uh, several subfield names in CS, and we want to derive all CS disciplines. The challenges of this kind of problem is that we should deal with noisy context feature derived from three text corpus, which may lead to entity intrusion and semantic drifting. Okay, so there are several related works of this set expansion problem. Um, from the method uh, from the setting wise, there are search engine based and corpus based. The search engine based are basically uh, processing all online and an example can be Google set. And the corpus based one is an offline processing method based on a specific corpus, which will be our main research focus. And from the methodology wise, there is one time entity ranking algorithms and there are also uh, iterative pattern based bootstrapping algorithms. So this is a very classic uh, algorithm of entity set expansion called ego set and the uh, it is called ego set because it constructs ego network by creating weighted edges between term pairs using the distributional similarity of those pairs of terms and after that after they construct a graph they will use a commun community detection algorithm called Lovin clustering to form uh, different clusters, and then they can do the uh, entity set expansion. So we will introduce a rather uh, a newer method called set expand. Uh, it is based on two context features. It is based on two modules: the context feature selection and rank ensemble module. This figure shows their uh, uh, this figure shows their uh, main framework. Basically, their assumption is that if two entities are from the same, if two entities are of the same type, then they should have very similar context features. As you can see here that Georgia has uh, both uh, Georgia and Illinois and Virginia has uh, the context feature of US state of blah, blah, blah. And these states can also have context features like the former blah, blah governor. So these are the features captured by this algorithm. And they basically uh, bootstrap the, both, both the entity pool and the context feature pool in, the, in an iterative manner. And before the final ranking, they will, uh, sample, the, they will sample multiple pre-ranking lists and uh, do a rank ensemble to generate the final output. And we will introduce two more uh, new studies in our group. The first one is that CoExpand, which is published in this year's Triple W conference. Uh, it is proposed to uh, solve the semantic drifting problem. So existing set expansion algorithms typically bootstrap the given seats by incorporating lexical patterns and distributional similarity. And, and, and so they can expand from countries to uh, like provinces, estates, and cities. So these are similar concepts, but run granularity. And the other kind of error could be uh, related, but not similar concepts, like uh, expanding from sports leagues to sports teams. So we also show a figure here of why there, this kind of semantic drifting can happen. 
So as you can see, the Canada as a country and Ontario as a Canadian province, they can have the same, uh, they can have same scape ground features. So uh, they can have this blah, blah, located at or Montreal, blah, blah, blah. So uh, these uh, shared scape grams are the reason that the ambiguity is introduced. So our method automatically generate auxiliary sets as negative sets that are closely related to the target set of user's interest. Specifically, these auxiliary sets can hold certain subtle relations in the embedding space with the user-interested semantic class. But for example, like for our countries, we can find provinces and cities as auxiliary sets. Then we co-expand multiple coherent sets and uh, so they are distinctive from one another. Specifically, we will find the most contrastive features to tell the difference between these sets. So this is the general framework of our uh, set co-expansion algorithm. Basically, we will first generate auxiliary sets and do the multiple set co-expansion. And for our auxiliary set generation uh, procedure, we will first generate representative terms for each entities in the seed set and then do a cross seed parallel relations clustering. So basically we will find, uh, we will um, first do an intra seed clustering that cluster terms related to seed, uh, each seed into the initial groups. For example, we will cluster the uh, Hamburg and Stuttgart as cities. And also here, uh, the, um, uh, uh, Bavaria and Saxony are states in Germany, so uh, they're clustered in small groups. And then we perform this interseed clustering to merge initial groups across different seats using the equation. So uh, as you can see, there is a word analogy relation in the word to vac embedding space. So basically, if these, if these uh, vector offsets are parallel, then we are going to cluster them in a large group because the uh, Hamburg and Stuttgart are cities in Germany, and Brisbane and Canberra are cities in Australia. So in this way, we can cluster the, uh, all the related terms into large semantic groups. So after we generate these auxiliary sets, we can uh, iteratively refine the feature pool and candidate pool in set expansion. So basically, we will not choose all the context features, but we will select the optimal context features based on this objective. The orange terms uh, ensure that the skip grams shared by entities in the same set are scored higher. And the purple terms uh, ensure that the skip grams shared by entities in different sets are scored lower. For example, if, then, if a skip gram is shared by both country set and the city set, then we will score them lower. And this is the, an evaluation performed on two data sets. So basically we compared with several previous studies and we also implement a simple bird baseline by averaging over the, uh, so we, we, we acquire the entity embedding by averaging over all its occurrences in the corpus. And then we get a context-free embedding. So uh, this, um, this is the mean average precision of the ranking list. And when the ranking list is longer, our method actually, uh, you can see that we have a larger margin over other baseline methods. Uh, this shows that our method is able to uh, steer the direction of expansion and uh, prevent the out of category words from coming in. And this is also a case study of what kind of what kind of auxiliary sets we can find. So for companies, we can find some products as auxiliary sets. And for TV channels, we can find their corresponding TV programs. And for sports leagues, we can find some sports teams. So our newest method is uh, called CG Expand. Um, it's, it stands for Class Guided Set Expansion. And the overall idea is to directly uh, find the class names of the uh, seed entities given from the user. So uh, for example, here we have the class probing query where uh, we want to find, uh, where we can find the class names of these entities. So basically we'll find countries and other candidates. 
And after we find the class name, uh, we will use the class name to find other possible entities belonging to this class. And then we will create the entity probing query like this one. So we will get other uh, entities in the same class. So how do we construct these kind of probing queries? Basically, we will leverage Hearst patterns, which are uh, a set of uh, lexical patterns, including these hypernymic relations. For example, countries such as US and China. This kind of pattern tells us that China, US belongs to the set of countries. So basically, we will construct the class probing query and the entity probing query by masking the specific uh, word. For example, here we mask the country, then this, is, this will be a class probing query. And here we mask the uh, country names, so this will be entity probing query. And after we get this probing query, we will use um, language models to do a mask language prediction using this probing query. And the language model will predict and will tell us what could be the missing words. So then we will select possible class names or entities from, uh, the, uh, from the ranking list. So basically, we'll first uh, show how the class name is generated. Uh, so actually, uh, we will first create this kind of uh, probing, uh, class probing, class name probing queries. And uh, combine, these all, combine all these ranking lists, we will get the candidate class names. And after that, we will re-rank these class names since not all of them are true. So basically, we will combine all the ranking lists from, uh, from we'll combine the ranking list from each seed entity. And uh, after we sum up the scores from each seed entity, we will pick the first one as the positive class names and the other one as the negative class names. So after that, we can uh, do entity set expansion by this class name guided entity selection. Basically, the entities, uh, we will only select the entities that are more similar to, uh, to that have a high score with the positive class name than uh, the negative class names. So our final output will be uh, the other countries like Japan, Singapore, and UK. This is a case study of our algorithm output. So basically for uh, seed entities like uh, in this, uh, in this con uh, for seed entities like Intel, Microsoft, and Dell, we can find positive class names as company and negative names like product and system. And for this ESPN News, ESPN Classic, and ABC, our algorithm successfully finds its positive class name as television network and some other negative classes are program, sports, show, etc. Okay, so this is the part for the uh, flat version, entity set expansion, and now we can go to the hierarchical version. So previously we have uh, mentioned that there are two types of taxonomies. The first one is instance-based taxonomy, which means that each node is represented by a single term. And the clustering based ones means that each node will be represented by a topic or a cluster of terms for a user to comprehend. So for this instance based taxonomy construction, the conventional methods usually decompose taxonomy construction into two subtasks. The first one is hypernemy detection and the second one is hypernemy organization. So the hypernemy detection one can be based on pattern-based approach or supervised approach. And, and they train a classifier to predict whether two terms in the vocabulary hold hypernemy relation. And after they find those parent-child pairs, a hypernemy organization step is done by either uh, simply pruning heuristics like removing cycles or the graph-based approach like generating maximum spanning tree from the graph. But since we have um, mentioned that the limitations of those uh, existing taxonomies are that they build a corpus agnostic and task agnostic taxonomy with mainly the fixed is a relations. So those generic taxonomy cannot model flexible edge semantics like uh, 
the country, state, city ones that, that the user may be interested in. And also they, uh, those generic taxonomy can contain, uh, um, can contain more, um, very uh, large amounts of irrelevant terms that the user may not be interested in. So they cannot fit user specific application tasks. So we'll introduce one work from our group, uh, which is called High Expand. Uh, it's a task guided taxonomy construction by hierarchical tree expansion. And in this figure, as you can see, the input is a domain specific corpus and a user input the taxonomy. So this user shows that uh, he is interested in this location taxonomy. And then this algorithm wants to output a more complete location taxonomy like this. And the core idea of high expand is that um, they will iteratively do width expansion and depth expansion. So the width expansion um, actually uh, is um, quite similar to the set expansion that we have mentioned before. So they uh, complete the concepts on each layer gradually. For example, for this US and China, they will find more country names like Canada, Mexico, and Russia, India. And they will also find uh, more concept, more parallel concepts with the US states. But what about um, the states in China, Canada, and Mexico? For these nodes that do not have initial children node, the algorithm uh, develop a depth expansion algorithm, which is uh, based on word analogy in the word to vec embedding space. So they basically use um, parallel vector offset to find the possible uh, entities in the embedding space. Okay, so these are the instance-based taxonomy construction, but for clustering, so, uh, but for clustering-based taxonomy construction, uh, these clustering-based taxonomy can help users to comprehend the concepts of each node by providing a topic for uh, each node. So there is a, a line of related work to our taxonomy construction, which is hierarchical topic modeling. Basically, there are a line of unsupervised methods that use a cluster of terms to represent a concept and organize topics in a hierarchical way. So one example is this HLDA, which assumes documents are generated by a nested Chinese restaurant process so basically, uh, each document will be uh, what choose a path from the root to the leaf node, and the words in that document will be sampling along this path. But due to its unsupervised nature, these algorithms can output some uh, topics that include very frequent but not informative words like this one. So this is why we want to include uh, user seats as weak supervision in our methods to avoid this kind of situation. And another example is this HPAM algorithm, which assumes documents are generated by a mixture of super topics, a, a, a mixture of predefined numbers of super topics and subtopics. So these are several works of um, clustering-based taxonomy construction method in our group. Uh, we will first introduce this taxogen, which is published in KDD 18. And it is an unsupervised method to construct topical concept taxonomy by adaptive term embedding and clustering. Basically, it clusters terms into a topic by the spherical clustering. For example, this machine learning and learning algorithm will be clustered into the ML node, and the general terms will go to, like computer science method and paper, will go to the upper level of computer science. So in their method, they design a ranking module to select representative phrases for each cluster. And for those phrases that are not representative for any cluster, like this computer science, these background phrases will be pushed back to the general node. And they also used a local embedding technique for a subtopic node. The, in the subtopic node, the embeddings are learned only on relevant documents so that they can only preserve information relevant to the subtopic. 
So the previous taxol gen method is also an unsupervised method. And in the CIRS KDD, we published a C-guided topical taxonomy construction method, which is uh, named Coral. Um, so basically, uh, our, uh, our idea is to um, include user, user guidance in the taxonomy construction. Be this is because uh, the unsupervised methods can produce countless irrelevant terms and fixed is a relations that dominate the instance taxonomy. So in this example, uh, the user might be interested in only the food taxonomy. So he gives in a, a C taxonomy and our goal is to output a more complete taxonomy like this. So basically, uh, each node will be represented by a topic or a cluster of terms to uh, to describe this to describe this concept. So this is the uh, main framework of our algorithm. We will first learn our relation classifier and transfer this relation upwards to discover potential common root concepts. And by uh, detecting these common root concepts, we may then transfer the relation downwards to detect more possible topics and their subtopics. And finally, to generate a topical taxonomy, we will find distinctive terms for each concept to describe each node. So for this relation learning procedure, we will use a pre-trained deep language model to learn a relation classifier with only the user given parent-child pairs in the seed taxonomy. Basically, we generate uh, these kind of relation statements. So for example, both the desserts and ice cream appears in the user seed taxonomy. And we assume that uh, if a pair of the parent-child nodes co-occurs in a sentence in the corpus, then this sentence implies their relation. And we use these uh, relation statements to train our uh, deep language model. And after we train this classifier, we can transfer the relation upwards to discover possible root nodes, such as lunch, food, and dish. These uh, root nodes can have more general context for us to find connections with potential new topics. So we can uh, then transfer these relation downwards to get, uh, to get new topics like pork, and even transfer it uh, downwards to get more subtopics for these internal topics. Since each candidate term has multiple mentions in the corpus, leading to multiple relation statements, we only count those con confident predictions. That means the KL divergence between the logits and a uniform prediction is larger than a threshold. So uh, if the majority of these predictions of the multiple mentions judge that a new candidate term is the child node of an existing uh, concept in the taxonomy, we will retain the candidate term to be clustered later. And another module is the concept learning module. This is used to learn a discriminative embedding space so that each concept is surrounded by its representative terms. For, uh, this, is con uh, this is used to uh, distinguish the fine-grained concept names because they can be closed in the embedding space and directly using unsupervised word embedding might result in relevant but not distinctive terms. For example, food is relevant to both seafood and dessert, but of course we cannot put food in either of these nodes because it is actually a more general term and it's not discriminative enough. Therefore, we leverage a weekly supervised text embedding framework to discriminate those concepts in the embedding space and this algorithm will be introduced in the next section. And also the subtopics will be filtered out if they do not fit into either of these constraints. The first one is that they must belong to representative words of that parent topic. Uh, and the second one is that if they, are, uh, if they don't share parallel relations with the given C taxonomy, then they will also be filtered. So we have uh, several case studies. For example, this is the partial output. Uh, this is uh, actually, this is our uh, partial output on the DBLP data set. Uh, the upper one is our user input as a seed taxonomy of CS subfields. 
and this is the partial output of our algorithm. Basically, we can see that there are more um, generated first layer topics like um, information retrieval, computer science, and database. And for second level, we can also generate more subfields in the data mining and also more subfields for new topics. Here we also show a more challenging setting where the user input is much lesser than uh, much less than the previous one. And we can show that we can also find some interesting things here, like different cooking styles of pork. This uh, char siu is actually an Eastern style of cooking pork and the pork steak and sausage are Western styles of cooking pork. And we also want to include another method which incorporates network information in taxonomy construction. And it, it is named NetTaxel, which is automated topic taxonomy construction from tax rich network. So basically it leverages the metadata in document, uh, the metadata of documents, like the venue of the paper and the author of a paper. And they use these metadata to construct a heterogeneous network to form a text enriched network. And uh, the assumption is that terms in scientific papers linked by the same venue or authors can belong to the same research field. So basically they uh, use a motif pattern like this one to uh, refer to a subgraph pattern at the meta level, which means that every node is abstracted by its type. So this NetTaxel method basically leverages both graph-based features and text-based features and uh, to construct a taxonomy construction. And they also conduct a motif instance level selection module to pick the most informative network structures for better topic taxonomy construction. So uh, let's, so this is for the taxonomy construction from scratch. And the second stage is the taxonomy expansion. And why do we need this one? This is because uh, in many real world applications, there already exists a decent taxonomy built by experts and used in production. And they only want to uh, update taxonomy by new items incoming every day. And they cannot afford to rebuild the whole taxonomy frequently. So uh, this taxonomy updating work cannot be fully fulfilled by humans because emerging terms take time for humans to discover. And what's more, long tail or fine grain terms are likely to be neglected. So automated, so automated methods should be uh, conducted on these tasks. So to form this question principally, we have three assumptions in this taxonomy expansion task. First, we assume that each concept will have a textual name so that we can do some kind of uh, similarity search. And secondly, we do not modify the existing taxonomy because downstream applications usually require a very stable structure. And thirdly, we focus on finding parent nodes of each new concept so that we can form it into a multi-class classification problem. So we will introduce two methods, the Texel expand and octet, which are uh, two methods that are recently published. There are basically two steps in solving this problem. The first step is self-supervised term extraction. That means they automatically extract emerging terms from the target domain. And the second one is self-supervised term attachment, which means uh, each, for each incoming new node, there will be a multi-class classification to match the new node to its potential parent and several heterogeneous sources of information can be used. So in the self-supervised term extraction part, the octet method adapts a state-of-the-art SIG-to-SIG model to extract the related terms. And their training data comes from the existing nodes in the uh, existing large-scale taxonomy. 
so that they can find desired terms to be extracted. And after this step, uh, the extracted terms will be used in the term attachment module. The octet method combines structural, semantic, and lexical representation to learn a term pair representation. And um, they then uh, form this problem as a multi-class classification problem. So they feed this term pair representation into a two-layer network. Basically, they use structural representation, which is uh, the interactions among taxonomy nodes. And they also use semantic representation like word embedding based features and also lexical representation, which uh, include the surface string level features. And the other method, the Texel expand one, uses a matching score for each query anchor pair. The query means the incoming new node, and the anchor pair is the existing nodes in the taxonomy. So basically, they want to find how likely each anchor concept is the parent of the query concept. And the, their basic idea is to representing the anchor concept in the existing taxonomy as an ego network. So the purple points are the parent node of an existing node, and the orange points are the child nodes of the existing node. So they use graph convolutional networks to uh, represent the ego network, to learn the representation of the ego net. So how to learn these model parameters in, in like graph convolutional network without relying on massive human label data? Basically, they can sample training data from the existing large scale taxonomy. For true examples, they can select a local subgraph around the true positions. And for false examples, they can randomly sample some false positions and then select the local subgraph around these false positions. And these are the framework analysis of these two methods. Basically, for the octet method, uh, if the term, if the extracted term recall is higher, then the edge precision will be lower. That means uh, the newly added edges might uh, have a lower precision if more related terms are extracted. So here they also provide a case study of the possible pre of the possible predictions of the algorithm. For example, for this word fresh car fresh cut carnations, they can correctly find a parent node of fresh cut flowers. And for this Texel expand method, they provide uh, an output of so this figure describes how many query concepts can find their correct ground truth parent node in the existing taxonomy within the top k predictions of the output. So as you can see, a lot of terms can have can find their ground truth parent uh, in the top one prediction output of the algorithm. For example, this Hindi language, uh, it can find the correct parent as linguistics and for this and for this enriched food, it can find the correct parent of food science. And for meta game analysis, it can find the correct parent node as game theory. Okay, so this is all for this part. And these are some references related to concept expansion, hierarchical topic modeling, and taxonomy construction and expansion. Okay, so um, maybe. Before we have a break, I can have a short Q&A session. So now I can, um, if you have any questions regarding to this part or the uh, previous part, then you can unmute yourself and uh, you know, ask questions. Yeah, thanks, Jashin. Yeah, so I think we have five to 10 minutes for uh, uh, for the question answering before we go to 40 minutes break. So uh, I think we, 
I'm not sure whether you can unmute the audience. Uh, yes, yes, I have unmuted them and yeah. Yeah. So then you can, if you want to speak out, you can unmute yourself on the Zoom uh, because even we unmute it, it doesn't mean you automatically will be unmuted, I think. You can unmute and you can talk. Uh, of course, you can put things on the chat. I think I, I answered some questions in the chat. Probably, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, this is Ganesh. Thank you for answering some of my questions on the chat. Um, one question I have is, it's a fairly generic question. In many of your taxonomy uh, uh, generation methods, uh, sometimes, I mean, it's, it's probably commonly observed due to noise too. You see these cyclic, uh, cyclic generations, right? For example, you can say that A is a root of B and you also get B is a root of A. So have you observed patterns like this? And if so, then how do you uh, kind of reconcile such cyclic uh, relationships that are output by your methods? Yes, yeah, so this is, uh, I think it will be some common uh, problems in the taxonomy construction method. I think that uh, there are some, uh, so basically there are some previous methods to um, remove those conflicting uh, edges, like the one that, uh, so in our slides, in our slides, uh, you so can, you can bring back the slides if you like. Out. But can you still, you still hear my voice? I can hear the voice, I can uh, see the no, slides. I can hear your voice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, great. You can bring back the slides you like. Yes. Um, I cannot see your slides, but uh, yeah, okay, yes. That's can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so. Yes, there are some uh, hyperlinking organization methods that uh, will prune those cycle edges and uh, will, re will retain the graph as a tree. Uh, and also, there are some methods uh, that, are, that is proposed in this high expand paper. It is about global optimization of the taxonomy tree. So basically, it will uh, determine the priority of these conflicting edges and remove those edges uh, that have a lower confidence. So I think maybe you can refer to this paper. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that. Actually, yes. for the for this particular question, the next uh, lecture, next part is discussing about the hierarchical topic mining. That one can also effectively reduce some cycling problems. The reason yeah, thank is, you. yeah, the reason is a topic usually sitting at a certain level. It's closer to its siblings. That's a one we, we are going to discuss the hierarchical topic mining. Uh, once you get into that part, you probably can see. Of course, for this, uh, you, you see this range of the methods. The major motivation we developed so many methods is because uh, if we do not have a clear supervision, humans do not give a very clear, you know, like uh, instruction which one is higher, which one is lower. Actually, you may generally introduce some noise. Okay, so to to actually the uh, most of these methods is try to get this we call concept shifting problem. That means. You introduce a wrong one based on the wrong one, you probably introduce more wrong ones. So that's the reason we try to use mutual checking, like, a, like those Korea, or like, a, you know, even set expand. The general idea is you ask multiple parties to vote before we can decide whether you are the true one selected or unlikely you are not in high quality. So we get a wrongs of iteration takes time. But we, every time when we pick up, we only pick up the most confident ones. So that, that kind of ensemble, we call this is rank ensemble. That means 
we rank, we get multiple people, rank them, then only those people get to, you know, majority vote or get a very high confident vote will take them, absorb them. Then we were based on the new seats to do another round of ranking. So that's the general philosophy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I also found a, a, a new question in the chat box. It says, what if there are synonym, synonymous class names such as TV network and television network? Would one of them become a negative class name? I think this is a very good question. Yeah, in our algorithm, uh, we currently uh, have not considered this kind of uh, synonyms yet, but uh, in this, uh, so in this CG expand algorithm, it can somehow, uh, it can somehow uh, uh, deal with this kind of problem because it actually do not uh, make these uh, positive class names and negative class names totally, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, totally uh, dispel from each other. Actually, they use some kind of ranking. So if the entities that ranks, so if the entities rank higher in the positive class name, but lower in the negative class names, then these entities will be chosen. So there is no uh, direct, you know, uh, there is no direct discriminative between the positive ones and the negative ones. So if there are like television network here and TV network here, then uh, still there will be um, we what we can find entities that are that co-occurred more with the t television network to the TV network. So basically, uh, this will uh, this ranking procedure will alleviate this kind of problem. But uh, to uh, to totally avoid this kind of problem, we can you know, introduce some synonym detection module to uh, find actually whether there are synonyms between these class names. And there are also some work in our group about the synonym detection module and I can uh, later find the link and send it in the chat box. Yeah, I think there's a new paper uh, by Jiaming Shen, our PhD student. It, what it, he's doing is he's integrating the set expansion and the synonym expansion together. Simply says, uh, there are some weak supervision on synonyms. There are weak supervision on sets. But then you probably try to integrate both. That means you know both sides. For example, you know New York City is a big apple, but you also know New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles are all cities. So you got those uh, training sets, how to use synonyms and uh, the sets, uh, try to expand on both ends. That means uh, sometimes when you expand, you focus on synonym. synonyms, some you expand uh, based on set expansion how to integrate them together in the whole expansion process. So that's a paper actually got a pretty positive review by a new conference. Since it's double blind review, uh, we cannot disclose it before it's officially got accepted. So we did not include that work in this tutorial. But it's a definitely good problem. Yeah, sure, sure. So I think there are probably there are uh, no new questions for now, and can we take, so I'm not sure how long. Yeah, we, in principle, we still take a 40 minutes break. So uh, that means we can come back. Um, you know, the Chicago time is 12.30 or 12.28. I think, uh, you know, Western time, Pacific time will be 10.28 or New York time or be 128. Is that good? Yes, yes. So for sure. we will come back later in uh, like 1030 on the Pacific time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So enjoy the break and uh, we will come back. Uh, many questions related actually related to part three. So we're going to discuss part three in detail. Thank you.
So enjoy. Thank you. Okay, so um, welcome back everyone. Um, basically, uh, in the first uh, half of our tutorial, we introduced our um, text embedding learning and taxonomy construction. And um, in the second half of our tutorial, uh, our major parts will be um, two parts. And the first one is called multidimensional topic mining. And the second one is basically on multidimensional text analysis. So um, in this, so in um, this third part, uh, we will be covering uh, a set of um, a lines of framework on unsupervised and weekly surprise topic modeling or topic discovery uh, frameworks. And um, the first half of this part will be uh, presented by me and the second half, uh, Justin will take care of them. So, okay, um, let's first um, look at the introduction of topic modeling. So um, suppose uh, we have a rather small scale um, tax corpus. Um, of course, people can uh, easily uh, browse over um, all the articles, read them one by one, and then understand the contents in the text corpus. But the question is, what if we have a large scale text corpus, for example, like a news uh, collection? So how to effectively, so an important question is how to effectively and efficiently comprehend this large scale text corpus. So our answer is that knowing what important topics are in this corpus is a very good starting point. Because topic discovery naturally facilitates a wide spectrum of applications from document classification organization to retrieval ranking, and also it can benefit text summarization. So basically in this part, we'll be talking up, um, more about the topic discovery process of a large scale text corpus. Okay, so um, the general idea of topic modeling is to use uh, very uh, little human efforts uh, to discover topics automatically from the corpus. So how they do that, they basically model the corpus statistics. And they assume that um, each document has a latent topic distribution and each topic is described by a different word distribution. And these two assumptions are shared by most, almost all topic modeling frameworks. And like shown in the bottom figure, we can have a set of topics described by different words. And in uh, for each talk document, we have its topic assignments or allocation uh, as a distribution over topics. So um, we will only um, take this very uh, classic and very popular, useful, successful um, topic modeling framework called latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA as an example for introducing the unsurprised uh, topic modeling frameworks. So as we uh, mentioned before, each document uh, is represented by a distribution of topics. So this is very natural because a document, can, a document can talk about different aspects or different topics. For example, a news document can um, be 40% on politics, 50% on economics, and 10% on sports or something like those. And meanwhile, we want to uh, represent each topic uh, via a probability distribution over words so that we can interpret um, what are the semantics of this topic. So for example, assuming we have a politics um, topic and we have a sports topic, the distribution of words inside these two topics might look like this. So for example, we have some important uh, words like campaign and speech um, inside the topic politics, while other words might have a lower probability distribution. And for sports, we might expect to see fun and baseball, these kind of sport related words uh, more frequently. So why is this model called latent Dirichlet allocation? Because it uh, imposes Dirichlet priors to um, this text generation process. So um, the motivation of imposing the Dirichlet priors is that we want to make sure that our two distributions, basically the document topic distribution and topic word distribution are both sparse. So, um, the sparse means that we will expect each document to cover only a small set of topics because um, we can't expect a doc document to be covering all like topics we have. So this is so-called a sparse document topic distribution. And meanwhile, we want to make sure that our topics um, only use a small set of words frequently because 
um, if a topic just use every word in the vocabulary uniformly, it cannot have a very uh, characteristic like semantics uh, to represent this um, uh, topic or discourse. So basically, this is uh, the motivation of imposing the digitally prior on the topic word distribution. Okay, so how do we formulate this um, generation generative assumption as a learnable like um, process? So basically, um, LDA outlines this kind of generation uh, generative assumption. So for each of the documents, we are choosing the document topic distribution from a Dirichlet prior, parameterized by this alpha uh, parameter. And for each topic, we want to have a topic word distribution. And this topic word distribution also comes from the Dirichlet prior. And for each word in the document, we are generating them one by one. So this is a bag of word, a bag of word assumption um, in this um, text corpus generation assumption. So basically, we're first choosing the topic of the word by sampling from um, the document topic distribution. So this is saying that um, the, the word topic distribution should be aligned with the document topic distribution. And finally, we're choosing uh, we are sampling the words real identity from this categorical distribution. And if you look at this graphic model, we can see that alpha and beta are parameter, uh, are hyperparameters to control um, the Jewish uh, priors. And then everything, every node in this blocks are latent variables to be inferred. And finally, this shaded W is what is observed in this corpus, basically is the, uh, is the word um, appearing in the documents. Okay, so how are we going to learn the LDA model? So first we need to make sure what needs to be learned uh, for our purpose of topic understanding. So firstly, we need to learn the document topic distribution, and this is to assign topics to documents. We need to figure out what is the mixture of topics, uh, the mixture proportion for each of the topics, uh, for each of the, the, the documents on, over the topics. And secondly, we want to figure out the topic word distribution, and this is to interpret um, the obtained topics. And finally, uh, we need to infer this latent um, words, latent topic Z. So how do we learn the latent variables? This is generally a very complicated problem because uh, the posterior distribution of this generative process uh, is intractable. So there are a set of um, strategies to tackle this, such as Monte Carlo simulation, Gibbs sampling, variational inference, but we won't cover too much, dive into this um, in this tutorial. Okay, so um, previously we have introduced the um, latent Dirichlet allocation, which is an unsupervised topic modeling framework. And next we um, want to add some level of user supervision. So um, we will introduce some supervised or seek guided topic modeling. So why do we want to incorporate user's guidance? Um, so the first thing to make it clear is that LDA is completely unsupervised. So is for a so are for all like almost all topic modeling frameworks, they are basically unsupervised. That is, the users only need to input the number of topics. And other than that, nothing uh, supervision from the user is expected. But the downside or, or the limitation of uh, unsupervised topic modeling is that they cannot take um, they cannot use the user supervision to guide the process. So a very, um, a very simple example might be like this. So um, this is the, here is the result of running LDA uh, on the New York Times data set. And look at what we're obtaining for different topics. We might, we might find that um, if a user is specifically interested in some topics, for example, uh, I'm interested in sports or sports related topics, I can never find anything that is related to sports, which is bad because I have specific interest, but topic modeling doesn't know that. So how do we do this? The first set of a uh, line of framework is called supervised LDA. So this is basically allowing the users to provide document annotations or labels. So basically as a user, I can label whatever documents um, of whatever topics I'm interested in so that I can control this generation, uh, generative process and obtain my topic of my interest. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So um, the basic generative process is still uh, pretty much the same, except that at the very last step, we have this label related generation. So across, uh, uh, apart from these unsupervised generation, generative process, in the last step, we're sampling 
the document label from a normal distribution. And this normal distribution is parameterized by the average of the worst latent topic in this document. So basically this is um, trying to contribute every worst latent topic to um, the document's final topic distribution. Oh, sorry, it's the uh, final document label. Okay, so what the problem of the supervised idea is that uh, although it can allow the user to control the generated process, it actually requires pretty much expensive like supervision from the user because sometimes the user don't, doesn't want to like label a lot of uh, documents. So another form of user supervision to guide the topic modeling is called seeded words. So basically, we, the user can provide a set of words to bias the generative process. So how are we go, going to do this? This is called seeded LDA. So um, the general framework of the, genera of the generative um, assumption still holds. But we want to make sure that the seeded topics um, can control or can impact our generative uh, process. So uh, recall that we have two types of distributions, the document topic distribution and topic word distribution. So how are we going to use the seeded uh, seed topics to uh, control the topic word distribution? Basically, we are splitting uh, two kinds of topics. One is regular topics, and this regular topics is exactly the same as the topics that is used in LDA. Basically, this topic can have a distribution over all words in the vocabulary. And meanwhile, we have another type of um, topics called seeded topics. So these seeded topics does not have a distribution over the entire vocabulary. Rather, it only generates words from the seed set. So assuming I provide five seed words, these seed topics will only generate from these five words. Okay, so how are we going to uh, really use this to generate the words? Basically, we're um, in this word generating process, we're flipping a coin. So basically, if um, the result is head, we are sampling a word from the regular topic. And if the result is tail, then we are sampling a word from the seeded distribution, a seeded topic distribution. Of course, the, this coin might not be like unbiased. It might be a biased coin because um, the probability of generating uh, the word from the regular topic might be generally higher. But this is generally the idea of how to incorporate the seeds in um, the seed topic, in the topic word distribution. And next we introduce how do we use these seeds to um, improve our document topic distribution. So basically we're coming up with this group topic distribution which is defined over the, which is um, essentially the seed set distribution over uh, regular topics. So we are assuming that for each seed set, it has a distribution, it, it is mixtured over um, the regular topics. And for generating each of the document, we are sampling from this group topic distribution and then use that as a prior to draw topic, document topic distribution. So basically we can use the seeds uh, in two ways to uh, improve the two uh, types of distributions in our generative assumption. Okay. So um, here basically we have introduced um, the previous unsupervised and uh, supervised and weekly supervised topic modeling. And next we uh, proceed to introduce our newly uh, proposed task called discriminative topic mining. So our motivation of proposing this novel discriminative topic mining task is uh, due to the limitations of previous topic models. So as we mentioned before, the unsupervised topic models, which is the mainstream of the topic modeling um, literature, actually fail to incorporate the user's guidance. And we mentioned that user's guidance sometimes are of high importance in terms of um, making the user satisfied with the results. So um, the topic models, since they are unsupervised, they basically tend to retrieve the most general and prominent topics, but these may not be of a user's particular interest or they can provide a skilled and biased summarization. And secondly, the topic modeling frameworks fail to enforce distinctiveness among the retrieved topics. So why do we want distinctiveness? So this is because um, we as humans we tend to understand the concepts via their uniquely defining features. And this provides the most clear understanding towards concepts or topics. For example, Egypt is known for pyramids and China is known for the Great Wall. And these are all uniquely defining features for the corresponding topics. So we can, uh, with, their, with the help of them, we can clearly understand um, the corresponding concepts. 
Okay, so um, what is the bad thing about failing to enforce distinctiveness among the retrieved topics for the topic modern frameworks? We provide a very concrete example here. So we ran the LGA on the New York Times dataset and we show the three topics. So we can observe that the, United, the term United States actually appears in all three topics. And these kind of overlapping of semantics cause a lot of confusion and ambiguity in terms of interpreting the models, uh, the model results, because we cannot clearly define um, what, what is the like semantics for each of this, these topics. So we are motivated to propose then this new task called discriminative topic mining. And we want to formally define our input and outputs. So basically we're giving a text corpus and set of category names. And our goal is to retrieve a set of terms that exclusively belong to each category to describe them or to represent them. And here we provide a very simple uh, example. For example, uh, the user might give us the United States, France, and Canada as the category names for the input of discriminative topic mining. And we want to correctly retrieve Ontario and Canada. This is a correct retrieval result because Ontario is a province in Canada and it exclusively belongs to Canada. However, it's incorrect to retrieve North America and Canada because the belonging relationship is reversed. Actually, Canada belongs to North America, not the reverse way. Also, it's incorrect to retrieve English under Canada because English is also the national language of the United States, which means that the English term, the term English is not discriminative uh, in, under this circumstance. So we want to highlight the difference uh, of discriminative topic mining from topic modeling. So firstly, we require a set of user-provided category names, and we only focus on retrieving terms belonging to the given categories. And our discriminative topic mining imposes strong discriminative requirements, and we require each retrieved term under uh, each category to belong to and only belong to that category uh, in terms of semantic relationship. Okay, so under this discriminative topic mining uh, philosophy, we're developing two um, sets of uh, topic discovery frameworks, one called Kate and the other called Josh. And uh, the first one is published in this year's web conference. And the Kate model is uh, used for discover flat categories, while the Josh model is extended to the hierarchical case. And this, is, this will appear in this uh, year's KDD conference. Okay, so um, I would like to first give you the motivation of our um, proposal of the Kate embedding. So in a nutshell, we would like to take advantage of two parallel lines of text representation frameworks. The first line is we want to take advantage of what topic models can do. So topic models use document topic distribution and topic word distributions to model the text generation process. And uh, topic models are able to discover the hidden topic uh, semantics. But the bad thing about topic models is that they uh, impose a bag of words generation assumption. So this is basically saying that we cannot use local contacts or global contacts to model um, the word semantics like uh, we did in word embeddings. So basically the order information in the text are completely lost in this topic modeling process. And on the other hand, we have another line of uh, popular uh, text representation learning framework called word embeddings. And this is introduced in our first part. So the good thing about word embeddings is that they accurately capture the word semantic correlations uh, in a distributed representation space. Um, but we have mentioned that most word embedding frameworks capture still use local contacts to uh, define the word semantics. Um, so they are not exploiting like the document level statistics, which we call as global contacts. And also the word embeddings cannot naturally model topics because we're not assuming any generative um, like process in this word embedding learning pro uh, in this word embedding learning procedure. So there is no hidden or latent topics involved in this process. So our goal is to take advantage of both frameworks to um, arrive at our Kate embedding design. So let's first um, take a look at a very intuitive example. So assuming that we have a set of celebrities, they might come from different fields or they might come from different locations or countries. So how are we going to embed them discriminatively? So 
the answer is that it really depends and we really have to have a criteria because if we don't have any criterion, we don't know which celebrity should be um, embedded closer to which other celebrities. So basically, if we want to separate them according to their fields, we might provide politics, science, literature to embed them according to their different uh, fields. And if we want to embed them according to where they come from, their location, basically we can provide category names like England and United States. So, um, the user interested topics or the structuring uh, requirements can be easily reflected via these um, category names. So this is the motivation of why we want to do category name guided topic mining, because it firstly allows the user to provide some level of user guidance to make sure that the results is of user's interest. And secondly, it does not require that much, that much human annotation or supervision and the category names are, after all, very easy to be provided by the user. So um, what we're going to um, learn and uh, optimize our model is basically formulating a text generation process. And again, we want to make sure that we incorporate the user's guidance um, in the form of seed uh, words or category names. So we assume a three-step process. So in the first step, we are generating the document condition on one of the N categories. So this is the topic assignment step. And in the second step, we are generating each word condition on the semantics of the document. And this is to model the global context of each word. And in the third step, we are generating the local context of the center word. And this is to make sure that the local context is in consistency with the center word. And finally, we will derive our likelihood of the corpus generation used for optimizing our model. So basically our objective will be a maximum likelihood objective, where the first term corresponds to topic assignment, the second global context, and the third local context. And we want to decompose this first term topic assignment into um, word topic distributions because that is what we most care about instead of this document topic distribution. So the question becomes, how do we know which word should belong to which category? We want to figure out this word topic distribution, which is essential for topic interpretation. As a starting point, we propose to retrieve the representative term uh, words for each of the topics by jointly considering two separate aspects. So the first aspect is relatedness. Basically, we want the representative terms to be closely semantically related to the category names. And this can be easily done by measuring the embedding cosine similarity. And second aspect is specificity. Because we want the category representative words to describe the topic, and it should be more specifically in semantic than the category name. As, a, a, as an example, we want to make sure that Ontario, a, Canada, a Canadian province, is related to Canada and more specific um, to than Canada as a representative term for the country word Canada. So um, we have already introduced how to learn embeddings in the first part of our tutorial. Now the question becomes, how do we know the specificity of words? Because this specificity signal is not naturally incorporated in the word embedding learning process. So we first propose this definition for measuring how specific or how general the word meaning is called word distributional specificity. We assume there is a constant or we assume that there is a scalar value kappa, which is non-negative that is correlated with each word indicating how specific the word meaning is. So we expect that the bigger the kappa value is, the more specific the meaning word, uh, the, mean, the word meaning has. And um, we assume that this word will appear in less varying context. So to give you a very simple example, we will expect the seafood, the word seafood to have a higher word distribution of specificity than food because seafood is a specific type of food. And you can expect the specific word seafood to appear in less varying context than the general term food because food can almost co-occur with every type of food. Well, seafood is a more specific kind of that. So how do we incorporate this um, distributional specificity signal into the embedding learning procedure? Basically, we propose this spherical model by incorporating this kappa value into our um, objective. So this kappa value will naturally become our distributional specificity of the corresponding word. And here uh, we provide some um, 
probabilistic interpretation of why um, this kappa value will correctly characterize the word specificity signal. So um, we have mentioned this VMF distribution before, um, but here we provide a graphic illustration that this, uh, what this VMF distribution might look like on the sphere. So basically for each of the, these VMF distributions, so now this sphere shows four VMF distributions. And now if we look at one of them, this red one, it has a concentration parameter, it has a center direction as well as a concentration parameter kappa. So when kappa is bigger, the points are more concentrated surrounding the center direction. And when kappa is smaller, the points will be more, will be distributed more uniformly across this uh, surface of the sphere. So our model essentially is learning, is jointly learning the, the word embeddings and the word distribution of specificity. So for example, um, assuming we're learning the embedding for uh, the word foot, we can have its centerward direction. And meanwhile, we want to characterize how specific or how general the centerward foot is. Then we look at its local context. If its local context is very diverse, it's, very, um, it's, ver it's varying a lot, then it's a very good signal that this centerward has a very general semantics because it can co-occur with a lot of different semantics words. Well, on the right-hand side, if we were to learn um, the embedding for the more specific word seafood, it co-occurs with a more limited range of semantics words. So um, this word will naturally become, have a higher kappa value and naturally become more specific. And finally, we want to um, mention how we are going to retrieve their class representative words. Basically, we want to jointly consider two criteria. The first being, uh, we want to um, we want the car uh, category representative terms to have higher embedding cosine similarity with the category name, and secondly, we want the words to um, have low distributional specificity, which is the word is more general. However, we want to make sure that the distributional specificity do not surpass the category names specificity because we don't want to put uh, North America into the representative word list of Canada. So our overall algorithm is conducted in an iterative manner. So in each iteration, we are training embeddings and then we're doing the representative word retrieval. And we repeat this process until um, we, we, we obtain enough category representative terms for each of the topics. Okay, so now we're ready to introduce uh, our experimental results. So our experiments are conducted on the New York Times data sets and on the Yelp. Uh, data set challenge. So each of, uh, bo so each of, so each of these um, data sets have two uh, dimensions. So for New York Times, it has topic and location. And for Yelp review um, data set challenge, we have foot type and sentiment. So as we mentioned before, we can use different category names to learn different discriminative embedding space according to different topics. And we compare with the following baselines. In, uh, including the enterprise topic models, seed guided topic models, and embedding based ones. So here we show the qualitative results. Um, so in the on the, uh, on the column along the columns we show the different dimensions of the t the set of topics. Like New York Times, we have locate we can um, split them or discriminate them uh, via location or uh, topic. And on the Yelp data set, we can use food or sentiment as the criteria. And here we only show uh, two categories under each of these dimensions, but um, they are pretty much representative for the overall results of our model. So we first look at the topic modeling based framework like LDA and CETA LDA. They actually fail to um, retrieve very semantically co coherent or correlated terms with the category name because they actually make bag of force assumptions and they fail to capture the accurate semantics that can be captured by uh, embedding based frameworks. So um, these frameworks are suffering a lot from semantic uh, inaccuracy. And for um, these um, three embedding based frameworks like topic uh, word embeddings and labeled uh, ETM, they are actually retrieving a lot of semantically relevant words like Germany, Spain, and Britain. But these terms are actually wrong in terms of interpreting um, the category Britain because they are essentially different countries. 
But if we look at our Kate result, we are actually retrieving a lot of uh, category related and distinctive terms under um, these different dimensions. So our Kate model is very effective on capturing um, the category are leveraging the category names as the weak supervision to learn the specific embedding space for discriminating the specific um, set of topic, topics. Okay, so here are the quantitative results. Basically, we're measuring on the topic coherence and the accuracy of how um, these category representative terms can describe the category name. And again, we're outperforming the baselines by a very large margin. Okay, so we also want to mention that our discriminative embedding can be applied to weekly surprise classification. So the so-called weekly surprise classification is that the users only provide the category names to guide the classification or training. And there is no label documents as the training data. So we will introduce this West class model uh, in the last part, in the fourth part, but um, for now we only need to um, know that it is an existing an existing classification model. And all we want to compare is to show that our discriminative embedding or weekly surprise embedding can outperform those unsurprised embeddings by a large margin. So basically we're comparing with um, these uh, famous unsurprised embedding baselines as the input feature to our West class model. So on the four dimensions, our when using Kate as the input text um, word embedding features, they actually provide a lot of the performance boost over the, these unsurprised embedding baselines, which shows that our Kate model effectively learns the discriminative information that can well uh, separate the categories and can benefit the classification performance. So we also do some, um, did some case study. So this is, um, th this is the process of our embedding learning uh, procedure. And in the very first epoch, um, the words, uh, corresponding to different topics are almost randomly distributed. But after we um, learn our embedding module, um, we can see that at epochs three, um, those embedding those um, ca uh, category representative terms already start to gather around the category names. And finally, uh, at the end of our embedding learning, these categories in the embedding space are becoming more and more dis discriminative. And the second case study, we're showing our course to find topic presentation. So basically we can use the learned Kappa value to sort our uh, category retrieved um, representative terms and make sure that the topics are presented in a general to specific manner. So if we constrain this Kappa value to be um, smaller value, we can expect to retrieve general terms corresponding to the specific topics. And if we increase the threshold of this kappa value, we can get more and more specific terms, but are still accurately corresponding to um, the provided category names. So um, we also developed a topic mining um, demo system for um, a good, a very good um, user interface to um, for convenient usage of our um, like embedding framework. And from this part, um, Jasmine will take part, uh, take care of the presentation. So I will be handing over the presentation to her. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess you can see my screen. So I am now showing you our demo. Uh, called Topic Mine, which is based on the Kate algorithm. And basically, this demo is done on the uh, DBLP, a subset of the DBLP corpus. And we want to uh, show the power of Kate of generating the representative and discriminative phrases of the user input categories. So here we provide a list of suggest uh, a list of suggest uh, suggestions of what topic names can be input, and we first want to show show you the uh, how do we uh, mine the categories of data mining, natural language processing, and machine learning. So basically, you can find that uh, this this table shows the category representative phrases under each category name. And you can find that uh, these words are uh, very representative to their own topic and they, they basically shows uh, the difference between uh, these three uh, fields. 
for example, the data mining has more emphasis on data analysis and tax mining is usually a word in the data mining field. And there is information network and so on. And in this natural language processing, there are also some subtasks that are you know, subtasks or concepts that are related to NLP, such as linguistic, linguistic resources, and uh, lexical semantics, and so on. And for this uh, machine learning, there are many things related to hyperparameter optimization, supervised learning, and many things related to naive base, and also regression. And we also uh, plot the so previously, we have introduced the kappa value for, uh, for the, uh, as the distributional specificity of each word. So here we still sort the words according to their kappa value. And basically, you can see that uh, these words are arranged from a coarse-grained to fine-grained uh, way. So uh, in this first level, these words are rather general, like the scientific data, data analysis, and linguistic resources, statistical methods, regression, hyperparameter. And in the second level, uh, these terms start to become a little bit um, fine-grained, such as some tasks in, the, in this researching fields, like graph mining, pattern mining. And in the lowest level, um, we uh, actually, the terms become even more fine-grained, and such as sequential pattern mining, uh, frequent items and mining community discovery, which are more fine-grained or are subset of their corresponding uh, parents in the more coarse-grained level. And for this natural language processing, we can also find uh, natural language understanding, natural language generation, and knowledge extraction in the second level. And the third level, there are more uh, fine-grained tasks like semantic role labeling and visual question answering. And for machine learning, in the second level, there is uh, logistic regression. And in the third level, there are more fine-grained techniques like um, kernel read re regression and EM algorithm. So we also want to uh, show some other possible categories. For example, I find this one rather are interesting. So we want to find what are specific words to research paper, to distinguish research papers, demos, and tutorials. So uh, I have already clicked the enter button and, and we should probably wait for about two to three minutes for this demo to give us some results because it is now run on my, being run on my local computer. And uh, so and also this is an uh, embedding framework on a rather large corpus, so it may take some time. Yeah, maybe it will take like for about two to three minutes and then it will show the category representative phrases and the phrases sort by specificity range. So basically the uh, it, it is doing an online processing, so um, yeah, we should probably wait for a while. So Jiaxin, while you are running the experiments, uh, we probably can, there are some questions uh, maybe you can answer in the, in the chat. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So you may look at it. Some you already, I think some questions already sort of answered by the, for example, there are some questions say whether we can use embedding to help uh, topic modeling. Actually, this is already answered to some extent. And some people ask about whether the lang instead of using category names, what about we use hierarchies as a seed? Actually, that's the one we are going to present almost immediately uh, on your hierarchical uh, topic mining. Yeah. So your mm. currently this machine it's running on your laptop or running on a server? 
Yeah, it's actually running on my laptop. And oh, so yeah, it's like about, so this is the uh, running log and it's now like, uh, yeah, it, it almost have finished 60 or 70%. And maybe you can see that uh, our every, for every epoch of this uh, embedding learning, we will generate one, um, will generate uh, one representative word for each category. So from the first epoch, there are only the uh, category names and for and in the second epoch we generate scientific papers and for demo we generate user sessions and for tutorial we generate overview and so we will and totally run five epochs yeah i think it yeah um, it's almost done um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you'll probably be can explain. So these are the uh, generated uh, keywords in each round of the embedding training. And yeah, it's a little bit slow on my local computer. Yeah, and this is basically the results to discriminate these three category names. For the research papers, uh, these terms are more related to written materials in research fields, like a pathology reports, scientific articles, student essays, and uh, medical record, and so on. And for the demo category, it is more related to the user uh, applications, such as single use, single user, streaming video, a graphical interface. So these are the uh, re or live video, live streaming. These are are more related to, uh, these are discriminative for this demo topic. And for the tutorial topic, uh, these terms are more related to the spoken materials. Or the, for example, there is overview, research challenges, and research directions, and et cetera. So, basically, uh, and there's keynote. So basically this shows that the tutorials are generally talking about uh, larger areas or directions than research papers and demos. Okay, so yeah, maybe we should um, now look into our um, following part. So now we will um, introduce the Josh, which is actually an extended version, uh, a hierarchical version of Kate. So basically it does hi hierarchical topic mining via joint spherical tree and text embedding. So basically this Josh method mines a set of meaningful topics organized into a hierarchy and it facilitates course to find topic understanding and hierarchical a corpus summarization and text classification. And different from the hyperbolic models that are proposed recently, like Poincaré embedding and Lawrence embedding, these, hyperbol these hyperbolic embeddings actually preserve absolute true distance. That means similar embedding distance, uh, means similar tree distance. But in our embedding learning framework, we do not aim to preserve this kind of absolute tree distance, but rather use it as a relative measure. For example, in this small subtree, you can see that the sports and the tree distance between sports and arts is two, and the tree distance between baseball and soccer is also two. Even though they have the same tree distance, in the embedding we as in the embedding space, we assume that the baseball and soccer should be closer than sports and arts to reflect their sentiment, their semantic similarity. And we basically use two objectives to learn this embedding. The first one is intra-category coherence. That means we want the representative terms of each category to be highly semantically relevant to each other, reflected by their high directional similarity in the spherical space. So this uh, 
CI means the embedding of category I, and this term means the uh, and this WJ is one of the representative word in belong to this category. So we want to maximize this objective to let the dot product of category CI and its representative words to have a large to be larger than the threshold M intra. So in this illustration, it means that the representative words of WJ should be should reside in this green cone so that we can link the representative words and category names together. And the other term is intercategory distinctiveness. That means we want to encourage the distinctiveness across different categories to avoid their semantic overlap. So specifically, this L inter, we want to maximize this term so that the dot product between two different categories should be less than a threshold of one minus M inter. So that means here the C1 and C2 should have a rather large, uh, uh, should have a rather large angle and this angle should be uh, larger than the threshold here. So since we're embedding this hierarchical structure, it will have many layers. So we want to recursively embed the local structures of the category tree. Specifically, each local tree Con consists a parent node and its children nodes. And we have this assumption that a category should be closer to its parent category than to its sibling categories in the embedding space. For example, uh, in this blue local tree, we want the film node to be closer to its parent category arts than to its sibling category music. In this way, the subcategories can distribute rather wildly and uniformly on the spherical space. So we modify this intercategory distinctiveness a little bit. Specifically, this uh, CI is our film node, uh, is our film concept, and this CR is the root concept of arts. And we want uh, the dot product of film and arts to be larger than a uh, larger than the dot product of film and music by a margin and enter. And besides the taxonomy embedding, we, we will jointly model the text gener we will jointly model the text embedding and the taxonomy embedding. So we, here we model the text generation condition on the category tree, which is quite similar to the uh, Kate embedding in the previous methods. We also have a similar three-step process. And here, the first one is topic assignment, where each document is generated conditioned on one of the end categories. And the second assumption is that each word is generated conditioned on the semantics of the document, or we can refer it to, uh, refer it as global context. And the third is local context, which is similar to word to vec surrounding words in the local context window generated condition on the center word. So this part is quite similar to the K one. And this is our overall algorithm. Basically, our algorithm is scales linearly with respect to the tree size. And, and we also conduct a set of evaluation on two Corpus, New York Times, and the archives papers. On both the topic coherence and this mean accuracy of generated representative words, our method performs better than the other baseline methods like hierarchical topic mining. And this is the C guided topic mining and several of our own work, Joe's and Kate. So here are some qualitative results on the New York Times corpus. Actually, we can mine a set of representative terms for each topic. Uh, for example, for the sports, on the first level, the generative terms are rather, uh, the generative terms are rather general, like tournament, championship, and team. 
but for lower levels, like the golf one, it can generate a representative turns only to this um, golf category, like golf club, nine hole, Tiger Woods, and representative turns to baseball, like Dodgers and pitching. And this is the result on the archives, archive paper data set. Basically, there are math, physics, and computer science tree, and we can generate different, different grained uh, terms for different levels of topics. For this computer science on the root node, the computer machine learning and artificial intelligence are the subfields of computer science. And for networking, um, its representative words are rather fine-grained, like cloud computing, PUP, and IoT. And for programming languages, we can generate libraries, Python, Java, that are only related to this category. We also visualize our joint embedding space by the Disney visualization. And this is the NYT joint embedding space. Basically, uh, yeah, the stars represent the category embeddings and these dots represent the, rep the representative word embeddings of each category. So basically the root node stays in the middle and the parent node stays in the center of each of their child node. And the children nodes, uh, the, cho uh, the embeddings of the child categories distribute rather equally around the parent node. And here is the joint embedding space of the archive data set. And this also shows a similar pattern with the previous ones, so that the uh, children concepts, this, uh, the children concepts distribute rather equally and wildly around its parent nodes. So this is uh, basically our uh, topic mining section. And for more references, you can look into these papers. So yeah. If you have any questions, um, maybe we can have a short Q&A session. Um, I think maybe we can just do the Q&A in the chat box um, because we still have one major part to go yeah. and we have like less than 40 minutes. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we will directly. Um, so if any of you have questions, please I'll put them in the chat box and we'll answer them. And now we can uh, go to the last section. So Prof Professor Han will be uh, delivering this one. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think there are some questions on the chat box about how to integrate, for example, using language model integrate with our Josh or Kate. I think it's a very good question. Uh, Actually, to some extent, uh, this uh, part four, we are going to discuss something related to this. Uh, by the time when we get it, I will just mention and remind everyone. So let me see. Uh, I'm sharing screen. I also start my video, so it may look a little more natural if you can see the, the person as well. So that, that's first, uh, just uh, get into this part four. Part four is more like if we got all kinds of embeddings, okay, uh, we got this uh, topic mining as well, how we can use it in the text analysis. So this one we called uh, multi-dimensional text analysis. Okay. So uh, this talk basically we partition into a, a few parts. Uh, one is uh, what's the motivation, okay? Uh, why we want to do multi-dimensional text analysis. Then we are going to give you the key problem for this multi-dimensional text analysis is how we can actually put the documents, the document collections into the right dimensions or dimension combinations. So then we can uh, kick in the multi-dimensional analysis effectively. Okay. So if you look at the contents of weights, uh, the first one is why we do we want to do multi-dimensional analysis. We say it very lightly. Then we get into the major part, essentially is document allocation or classification in this multi-dimensional space. 
Then finally, we get into the cube-based or multidimensional-based text analysis. That part we also treat it lightly. The major core part is how we put the documents automatically into the right place. Okay. So the first thing is we call these multidimensional analysis. In many cases, we put them into a text cube. Actually, don't uh, you can psychologically or visually view them as a multidimensional space. We call this one as text cube. However, in the real analysis, whether you really put in the cube model or not, it's not that essential. But the essential thing is you really want to think, my group of documents is in the right place. Okay, so you can think in this way, then you get into brand, product, field, all these things. Okay. Let's look at the so-called multidimensional text cube. Okay, the multidimensional text cube means you put the, the documents into multidimensional space. Of course, some documents may be related to more than one dimensions, very likely, or even may be related to the constants within one dimension. Just give you a simple example. Okay, suppose you got a document which is related to both economy and the US. Okay, so then you actually your document likely will be put in this cube space is related to both United States and economy. Okay. However, sometimes you may say, I'm discussing a sports which is between New York City and Los Angeles, where I should put actually this document in the location why these related box. So it's not so essential you would think every document must be uniquely put into one place. However, we give you the good, good classification methods then you know how to put them into the right place. Okay. So now we uh, get into the core problem. If we want to kick in the multidimensional text analysis, how can we construct the text cube? So-called construct the text cube is one way lay out the framework, the taxonomy. For example, if you look at the events, you may think, the events may be one part related to disaster, another part related to sports, or, and so on. And uh, under disaster, you may have COVID, you may have a hurricane, you may have fire. Okay. So then you can go hierarchical way. That one, we say it's related to taxonomy construction. We discussed in our part two. Then we get into document classification. Essentially, document classification is we want to put the documents into the right cell. <clears throat> so if it's about a Japan disaster in 2015, we were put into this first cell, okay? So that's basically the, the document classification problem, okay? Now we get into a few uh, algorithms or methods which represent in a few papers. <laughs> so the first paper we introduced actually is called Dr. Cube Algorithm. Uh, by name, you probably can think about it. You get lots of documents, you want to automatically put them into the cube. Okay. This one was published in ICM 2018. Then we are going to introduce a few. I think in the previous part, we did introduce like an Emons Kate uh, algorithm. Uh, when we do the document classification, we actually use this West class. So-called West class is weakly supervised uh, neuron text classification. We just uh, abbreviate them as West, West class. Then for the hierarchical version, we get a West class, uh, incorporate the metadata. <coughs> we get into the CIGAR paper, MathCAD. The most recent one is immediately related to some people in the jet box said so how we can use a language model to work together with uh, you know Josh Kate these algorithms actually we are going to show you this one uh, which has not been published yet even we got a very positive review because it's double blind review we could not uh, dis distinct disclose the authors and the venue but uh, we will give you a little uh, flavor on um, likely what we can do by introducing BERT or those kind of language models. Okay. So let's first look at the Dr. Cube. Okay. Dr. Cube, the general philosophy of this. Okay. 
Suppose we get lots of documents, <clears throat> but nobody want to labor them to give you a good sample because you know, you get millions of documents, how many uh, real sample you have to labor them, say this one belongs to class A, this one belongs to class B. It's a lot of a tedious work, okay? What we claim is this, what about people just give you the dimensions and each dimension they give you, say, labels, okay? Or names, we call it category name, you think about this. For example, for themes, People can give you like sports, politics, economy, entertainment, or whatever. They can give you this. For countries, they can give you like USA, China, Russia, Germany. They can give you this. And then they can give you years or the months or something. So we have three dimensions. Suppose we have topic dimension, time dimension, location dimension. However, once you get into the concrete documents, like the first one, so the Super Bowl is on the air, uh, from Chicago, Illinois or something. How could you put this one into the right cell? Of course, by human, you say, oh, that's easy. It, it is about USA, it's about a Super Bowl is a sports. And uh, then that says 2017, I put in the right cell. However, in most cases, you have the constants or names. They don't really have the class label. And uh, for some class label, it even could be wrong. Later, we'll give you examples. However, you look at this, you, you say, if I have an automated mechanism, I read this why I put in the right cell, in a sense, I classify in this part, in the topic part, I put it into sports, in the location part, I put it into US, okay, that's, that would be great. How can we do that, okay? So that means we have very weak supervision. The only supervision is the category name, or we say the class name. For example, like here you get a USA, or here you get China, that's the only one you get, okay? Then how could we do things? We, we generate anything we think it will help to put documents in the right, right location, okay? So the interesting thing is we, if we do not have anything, but we have a large unlabeled corpus, okay? So these unlabeled text corpus, will serve as, you know, base for our weekly supervised approach. How can we use a weekly supervised approach? Actually, the key part is embedding, okay? So I will not give you detail on the embedding because the, the one when we do Dr. Q, the embedding we are using actually is the old embedding to some extent is work back, okay? Now we have more advanced embedding later, we, we're gonna show you we, we can do it far better. However, even just use word vacuum embedding, you probably can see there's something quite interesting, okay? So the general philosophy, I go back to this, I would say it is you got a label, okay? You get a class label, you get documents, and you get lots of terms, okay? What embedding you are going to get is you're looking at a term, you know, distribution between the label and between the documents. And with this, you gradually, based on embedding, you enlarge your, your, your word. You know, some words could be good dimension or category dis, dis, distinctive or disclosing words. Let's see, I'll give you this example here, okay? Let's look at this. Suppose you just got a term called stock market. You actually do not know, of course, human knows spark market must be related to economy, okay? But how the machine automatically know this, okay? So the machine actually based on embedding and based on distribution, okay? You look at distribution, you can clearly see. By embedding the stock market, we embedded a lot of other similar terms. However, the embedding will automatically link to many different things to look at their distribution, okay? If you look at this distribution, you probably can clearly see. First, if you look at distribution uh, on the location dimension on different countries, you probably see the stock market as a word that this, and it's embedding. The distribution across different countries is more or less even. That means you look at the, the distribution is almost every country may have documents related to stock market. 
So stock market is not a good location dimension you know, signal. Okay. So that means the stock market cannot be used to disclose or distinguish locations. However, if you look at the topic dimension, look at its, its embedding distribution, you clearly see you have a very highly skewed distribution. Stock market is very closely related to economy. The second related is politics, but not, it's already dropped down quite a lot. And sports and arts is really minimal. In that sense, you probably can see a skewed distribution. You can assert stock market actually is a good candidate on topic dimension, especially is a good candidate to distinguish economy from the others. So that means you were, among many, many keywords, you were first pick up, say, stock market because it's so good, okay. So let's see uh, our running example. Just here, I just show you the running example, like the only label we give for topic is we give you something like a movie, baseball, you know, like uh, business, law enforcement. Like in the location, we give you Brazil, Australia, Spain, and China. Those are the labels, the keywords. Okay, with this label, you probably can see like movie. With uh, running this, uh, doing this uh, seed expansion based on many, you know, candidate keywords and their embedding and their distribution. Uh, you look at a distinctive, frequent and distinctive distribution. You will find a movie, the first candidate for the expansion is films. Then you get a director, you get a Hollywood. You probably can see you only got a movie, but however, you running through those different keywords, you will find actually you will find some dimension distinctive and also highly signal, you know, highly sentinel words like films, director, Hollywood. You probably look at all the others. You, you grab like a China, you grab Chinese, you grab Shanghai, you grab Beijing. So these are very good words you first grab it. It's almost like human, but this is purely based on embedding, based on distribution, you can judge it, okay? Of course, the technical details, I'm not going to get into very detail, but this actually shows you only have the label names, you still can do a lot of things, okay? Now we get into our second one. The second one is the West class, okay? West class general philosophy, is uh, we use weekly supervised the neuron text classification. Okay. The general philosophy is we may have various kinds of weak supervision. For example, people may only give you a labor service name like a politics versus sports versus technology, or people can give you a set of class related words. For example, for politics, they can give you a bunch of three to, to five or to 10 keywords. Uh, same thing for sports, same thing for software, okay? Or they can give you a set of labor documents. That means if somebody give us a labor, we're not wasted, we still can use it. Okay, we are going to, when we do the experiments, we will show you for each kind, we actually can use the labor effectively to do these uh, classification, okay? And how we do this, okay? The, Actually, there are two major things, uh, two major steps. One we call pseudo document generation. The pseudo document generation means uh, since we only give the class label or very weak uh, supervision like a set of keywords, the signal could be biased, could be very sparse. We want to actually use a pseudo generated, uh, use generated model, generate some pseudo documents so we can remove certain kind of sparsity problem or bias problem so that we can have better, you know, balanced uh, pseudo documents for each, each class, okay. Then we feed this one into deep learning model, for example, CNN or RNN or uh, any other things we think if you think it's you like or it's useful. And we get this uh, parameter, okay. With such parameter, we actually can get an unlabeled documents feed in, and then we will generate the correct labels, okay. So that's the whole document classification process with weak supervision, okay. The details, because the limited time, I think you already 
see Yumon give a lot of uh, these formulas. The general idea is you have concentration parameter like a kappa, uh, that's what we already seen, and you have the mean direction, and with this you will get a probability distribution computed. Okay, and in the spherical space you will find you know the the computation will be surrounded around each major C. Okay, that's pseudo document generation using generative model. We also can do that. Okay, uh, let me say. And once we generate this, we do the pre-training using neural, neural network model, okay? Deep uh, learning network model, CNRN. And then we use this model, get shared parameter, then we can do the real classification. Then the classification is based on distribution, okay? So I will show you the results you can see. Actually the results is we use, this is essentially document classification. Actually, this one, I should say, because we report this results on, in 2018, that time we haven't uh, get this K to get a Josh and a, get a Jose, these algorithms yet. So we just use uh, this, no matter you do embedding, you do the generation, we actually use uh, all the methods. But still, you can see with this weak supervision, you compare, you compare with the others, uh, like IR with TF-IDF, topic modeling methods, data less, which is Dan Ross in natural language processing, and the PPE is, is a network-based model, and these are the neural network model. Uh, the, then you actually can see the results. Probably, among, you can use only labor as supervision or keywords as supervision or a set of document supervision. The so-called weak is the labels essentially just one label. Keywords just like three to five keywords or document. Later, I'm going to show you, you give more labels, actually some methods can jump up a lot. But anyway, you can see using very weak supervision these West class uh, HAN is one net, uh, neural network model, CNN is another one. Then you probably can see the CN one already I mean, both uh, the deep learning model with this weak supervision for New York Times, AG News, or Yelp Review, you get a really high quality. This is for macro F1, micro F1, you get a very similar results as well. So that's about uh, uh, the weak supervision. Then we look at the number of labor documents per class. You actually can see for each class, if you start with 10 labels, and the highest one, this purple one, is West class with a CNN, uh, with a CNN deep neural network model. You actually you get a 10 or 20, of course you get 20 labels, you, you go a little higher, but probably that's almost all you need, right? Uh, but other methods like PTE, if you only give it 10, actually it's a, it's a pretty low quality on the micro F1. But once you give like 50, 40, 50 labels per class, it jumps up quite a lot. But still, you look at this uh, method, the weak supervision method actually is equivalent to many labels you put in. Okay. So this is about a West class. Then I'm going to discuss a little on WESH class. Uh, WESH class essentially is uh, this, we change this to H, means hierarchical. So essentially it's a weekly supervised hierarchical document classification, which is published in Triple AI 2019, okay. So the general philosophy is this, okay. You may want, the, the class labor can be organized into hierarchies, okay. Then I can we, uh, you give me a documents, can we put into the right, not, not necessarily leaf notes, but uh, uh, likely some could be, for example, uh, you get music and dance, but maybe yours is more general arts, covers many topics. So you probably should put in the arts instead of music or dance, okay? So in that sense, you can put the document, the candidate documents 
into the right level. It could be leaf, it could be intermediate level. That's what we call a hierarchical text classification. So for the hierarchical text classification, uh, the general philosophy, because the limited time, I will go over it rather quickly. The general philosophy is you can do local classifier pre-training, and then you actually can do uh, essentially is a global classifier classification. You based on the philosophy of this. Okay, you can look at this philosophy in this graph. The graph could be this. Okay, you may have a topic. You actually can say, I, maybe this topic is about a gun control, okay? Uh, then you actually can see the distribution. You, when you classify, it could be politics. Then you get into military, you get a gun control. You may find your uh, computation finally say, actually this document is really related to gun control, then you can put it into gun control. Otherwise, you see, if the distribution, the low level is somehow vague, okay, it's not a distinctive, uh, then actually you actually may think you put into the higher level, you get a higher probability. You can calculate those probability and put in the right position. That simply says you can distinguish them in the, in the low level, you can put in the low level. Otherwise, you, you look at the second level or third level, to see which one you should put, I mean, the higher level you can put into the right class, okay, based on the class distinctiveness, okay. So that distinctiveness, there are lots of uh, formulas related to this. Essentially, is you do the global classification, you can consider uh, you, your, your distribution is based on under parents, what's the probability of this child? And, uh, and what's the probability of this parent? Calculate this probability distribution. Then you start with pre-trained classifier, you compute the pseudo label based on the current prediction, then you try to minimize the KR divergence, then you iterate them uh, and you put them in the right level, right class, okay? So uh, there, there's a mechanism called blocking mechanism. The blocking mechanism, the general idea is if you can put into the internal class clearly, then you don't need to go down. You should block, you know, to avoid it, go down to get too fine one because at the higher level, you already make a very good distinction. Then you should put it down there instead of go to too fine class. So this is a blocking mechanism to ensure you don't get into, you know, too refined one with minor di uh, distinction you put in the wrong class. So for this hierarchical classification, you see, we actually did uh, the New York Times archive and the Yelp review as data sets. Uh, we also compare with a lot of uh, comparative algorithms. The method uh, give you clearly give you very good uh, results based on both macro and micro F1, okay. So I uh, briefly introduced this wedge class. Now I get into the Matcat. I think I have, I have only 10 minutes to go. Okay, so I go really quick. So this Matcat algorithm is, is a CIGIR paper. Okay, the general philosophy is this. We not only have global data, we also have local metadata. But the key is in the past, we do not use metadata. So for metadata means, just thinking about DBRP, you get, a, you get a document, you actually know the author, not only you know the words, you actually know the uh, venues and authors and all the other information here. So those are the metadata information, okay? For example, like uh, uh, global metadata could be user, author, product at the global level. Local metadata means for your particular document, in the document, you may find a tag and a hashtag, like in tweets. Okay, so how we can use this uh, information in social media, in GitHub, or in, uh, you know, like DBRP or archive, how can we use this global metadata together with the documents and working together uh, to do the good classification? Okay, so the general idea actually is uh, the metadata you can based on metadata and, and the class label, 
you can get the distribution. And also you can, based on document, you get a word, you get distribution. Uh, document, you get a tag, you get distribution. And document based on the context embedding, you get, get a distribution. Then finally, we want to Im calculate the embedding and use the generative model, which I will not have time to get detail. And finally, you can train this classification model based on embedding based on multiple signals and finally get a better result. So I'll give you the last one is the neural network language model. That's exactly respond to some chat box, some uh, you know, audience actually gave us a very good question. Say we got into uh, you know, like a West class, West class, we get a different embedding. Now people actually got a lot of uh, language models. For example, BERT, Roberta, you know, Electra, you know, all these things are BERT. So how can we use pre-trained large scale general knowledge to help our classification, help our embedding, working together with it? Okay, so that's exactly this is the motivation. Okay, the motivation, I can give you this one, like we originally use a West class, we show actually you can get a good keywords, like sports, you get words sports, you say, oh, that must be right. Actually, it still could be wrong. Like here, I give you an example. Okay, this the, the this example table one. You probably can see, you get a, the first one the, on the left side. You get a sports. It's really about sports, a U.S. team sports competition. However, the second one you do have a sports, but actually it's not really about sports because they say this mobile phone sports a dual in a hard disk can, can store something. This sports actually is kind of features. It's not really sports. Okay, so then you get into this. If you just based on the original single text without thinking about the language model, you do not look at a you know plus minus your local or global embedding, you actually make things really wrong. Okay, so what we can do is we can use this language model. For example, if you use bird language model to look at the first sentence, you actually will generate a prediction is sports, baseball handball, soccer, or those kinds of things. But you look at the second one, if you use BERT model, you actually get a features use includes, contains, featured, incorporates, or requires. So you probably can see, these are completely different things even for the same sports. Can we use this language model to help our classification? Okay, so that's what actually uh, the, the group, actually the member, I should not disclose the author, but it definitely is include our current uh, ones in our tutorial, right? So what you can see is you use bird encoder uh, and you can actually doing this mask in your sentence, you get a right related words or right uh, category. This information can help our classification to make it more powerful. Okay. So the general philosophy, I just give you uh, because I do not have time and also it's a little confidential, I, I, I should not say in a very detail. However, what you can see is this, we only take the class label, okay? And then we put it into the language model embedding in a large corpus. Then you can see for classification, weekly supervised classification in all these corpus, like AG News, DB, PDI, MDB, Amazon, you clearly see these is uh, obvious winner, uh, both of them. Uh, one is using self-training, one is without self-training. But anyway, if you just use BERT with simple match, you still cannot uh, comp compete with this because this one actually used BERT as a processing tool. But we also used the philosophy of embedding with wet, uh, this kind of a West class of philosophy. Actually, you can get something better, even stronger. So, I mean, this one, the last one is fully supervised. You, you look at it, if it's fully supervised, the bird actually still get an even stronger performance. However, this one is use only one label name, okay? Like sports versus entertainment versus politics versus history, nothing else, okay? But you get something very close to even fully supervised model. So, uh, then finally, I have only five minutes. I 
basically give you uh, how we should do semantic analysis. Okay. The semantic analysis, if we put things in the queue, that is becomes very powerful. For example, this one is uh, years ago, we manually put the documents into the high dimension queue. We analyze thousands of uh, NASA's aviation safety report system. That means they put a lot of safety report about flights. Okay, we actually can, you probably can see, we can get a, like a similar documents finding, like a keyword distribution, like for example, you say snow, you, you, you want to see where it contains snow. Snow, you actually can see in this uh, aviation report system, the snow mostly happened in the, <coughs> I think this one is related snow, happened in those regions, dark region, like Alaska or North Dakota or some places, Montana or something. You probably can clearly see uh, for aviation, the pilot communication related snow is around the snow region, okay. Uh, so then with another interesting thing is we can do comparison. The comparison uh, in the high dimension space becomes very useful in the sense you put documents in the right class. Now you wanna compare, for example, you wanna compare US economy versus China economy or you want to compare China politics versus China economy, then you probably can see, you just based on these multi-dimensional cube, you immediately can get all the distinctive keywords. The general philosophy is we use the three measures. One we call integrity. Usually you get a high quality phrase as high integrity. You get a popularity, means those uh, uh, phrases are reasonably popular, but distinctness, distinctiveness means you, you want to compare A and B. You want to find these words or phrases which are integrated, popular, and a distinctive, okay? So we combine them as a joint measure, okay? So then we can, I will not have time to introduce you the detailed formulas, but I can show you, okay? This is 2016 uh, presidential election, okay? You just look at the, uh, the share is the U.S. and you get a gun control versus immigration versus poly, poly, domestic politics or something. You look at the gun control, we dig out the phrases, gun laws, National Rifle Association, gun rights, background check, or assault weapon ban, mass shooting, high capacity magazines. Those are the very popular, very distinctive keywords related to gun control, okay? The interesting thing is we show the politics, which is, looks very reasonable. Uh, I give a talk in medical school at UCRA. They, the medical doctor says, if you can do this, now I'm going to ask you to do something real in PubMed. They actually told us there are six categories of heart problems, cardi cardiac diseases. They want to find which protein is related to which particular uh, class of the disease. The reason they have a hard time to find is because uh, those proteins actually shows almost everywhere in almost every disease. They wanna see which protein plays a major role in this disease, but not in the others, okay? That means you need a popular and distinctive analysis. And we run through this we actually give them like top five or top 10 proteins. They got so excited. Why they got excited, the medical doctor told us, we found number one is exactly the one they use it to treat patients. However, some patients have no response on the treatment of number one protein. They wanna find other proteins. They just, it's buried in millions of documents and buried with many similar proteins. It's very hard to find. And we found number one is right, they actually think trust our number two, three, four could also be very good candidates. So they say actually they're gonna try some trait, some other proteins in the high rank one to control this disease. So that's the, the one we got very excited. Hopefully we can help the medical science as well. So I'm going to show you, I have only one minute left. I'm showing you, actually we use it to, on the news analysis. This is about Ukraine. Uh, this, uh, you know, interesting thing about Ukraine-Russia conflicts, uh, you can see the, the Army Research Lab give us 
six categories. And each category, we only use like a three names as a label. But we found a lot of things, something very subtle. For example, if you look at the Russian-Ukraine conflicts, pro-Russian is political phrase. But pro-Russian separatists, we put into military. Why we put in the military? Of course, they relate to politics. However, those are the people who really hold the guns and they try to fight in the battle, okay? So these are the military things. The interesting thing is uh, the Army Research Lab found one thing they say we could be right. Uh, we could be wrong is a surface to air missile. They say you put into civilian. How surface to air missile put in the civilian but not in the military? Yeah, we, we, we thought we made a mistake, but when we look at it, we found in the whole Russian-Ukraine conflict, surface-to-air missile was never used in military fighting, but only used to shut down the civilian airplane. Okay, so all the surrounding reports, everything surface-to-air missile is on um, shut down civilian aviation airplane. So that's why we put into civilian. So you probably can see it's pretty interesting in the sense you are not doing general bird. You are putting this into the right documents, you put in the right category. Okay, so for Hong Kong protest, you probably can see we only give five categories, political, police, economic, information, infrastructure. Then you look at this, like a Carrie Lam is political, everybody knows. And uh, police, you look at a water cannon, pepper spray, petrol bomb, bean, bat, bean rounds, and fire tear gas. These relate to police and, uh, and the protester conflicts. Any information you actually can see, those are the information, uh, including internet censorship, including Weibo, including Global Times, you know, all these related to the news, to, to the information. Okay, you probably can see it's pretty smart. And we use it for, COVID analysis as well. Uh, for example, uh, Remdesivir, okay, which is the one which uh, Parker used for, for trade COVID-19. You see the documents. These are the sentences in the documents. You quickly get a PubMed articles. And uh, these is, you can get a high level. For example, you say, I want to find articles on coronavirus causes disease or syndromes. Then you probably can see we get it, get into these articles. This is a meta level, and you get it, the sentences right up. Okay. So I think we finish this. Uh, we really don't have time, uh, but I can just uh, finally wrap up uh, to conclude our tutorial. Uh, I intentionally make it really short. Uh, so this is only. Okay, sorry, this is our starting point. Uh, let me get into the ending point. The ending point is summary. So I only use you know, two slides. One is about our tutorial summary. We give the four major parts, covers, and then we just say our whole game is from unstructured text to structured knowledge. And there are lots of research frontiers. We did something, but we think there are lots of things to explore. Okay. Finally, we just show, you know, we got lots of research papers of books. Uh, starting from data mining, now we move more and more into massive text, how to do embedding, how to do multi-dimensional analysis of uh, the text. Okay, then we finally acknowledge uh, lots of uh, federal agencies and companies support our research uh, and collaborating with us. Thank you. So I got a few minutes over, but uh, anyway, if you are interested and you still want to raise questions, we can uh, we can actually get it into question. But I think uh, we probably should not uh, get it too much. We probably have. At most five minutes, we have to finish everything. Okay. So, uh, any questions or anything in the in the chat box? I did not get a chance to to see. Maybe Jiaxian, Yimeng, you can help answer it as well.
Yeah, so um, I think although we have limited time for our uh, tutorial presentation, uh, you can always um, post your questions in the VFair chat box after we um, end our uh, tutorial in the Zoom uh, application. I think, I believe that on um, VFair chat box will be valid um, for this entire duration of our uh, KDD conference. And also, uh, even after the KDD conference, if you want to um, ask any questions uh, or have any comments, feel free to reach out to us um, via email or um, um, maybe visit our GitHub accounts and post any issues if you encountered any uh, when running our code or something. Yeah, I should thank uh, Iman and Jiaqin for the brilliant work because this tutorial essentially uh, not only they spend that much effort to prepare and lecture the tutorial, they spend more time to do research. And the, the tutorial, if you look at the majority of the contents are their work and published in the last uh, 12 months, you probably can see. Of course, they still have lots of things uh, in the queue yet. But uh, these are the, our rising star uh, in the lab. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Jiaxin, you have unmuted everybody? Yes, yes. I have allowed them to uh, unmute themselves. So, if any of you have questions regarding the previous parts, you can uh, unmute yourself. No, yeah. Um, so this is uh, our Asha. Uh, my my tag name is Farah Rash in the chat. I've asked a couple of questions already. Um, so the question is, um, is there an equivalent way of uh, figuring out the topics in an un completely unsupervised way? Uh, I'm thinking of something like the elbow method for a clustering that we choose how many topic dimensions should I, uh, uh, sh uh, should I figure out for this? And the user can go and look at the clusters later on and figure out, yes, this was the topic that uh, we've clustered together here instead of supplying them uh, from the beginning. Um, maybe you can uh, make your question a little more uh, succinct, so we can we can answer more concrete. So is this what you are like asking in the chat box? What is the blocker from having a successful? Is is that um, your question? Yes, that's that's the same question. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm actually typing uh, my answer to this question. Uh, right now, but yeah, since um, we can just uh, answer this in real time, I think, um, yeah, maybe later I can still um, enter my uh, answer. But um, for now, I think, um, firstly, um, you can definitely run the topic models if you're referring to, um, if you are referring to the unsurprised topic models by meaning the like unsurprised models. So, um, you can definitely run the unsurprised topic models for um, with a large number of topics. For example, you can set um, the number of topics to be 100, 200. But in general, the more topics um, you obtain, the more time you will spend on um, like examining them. And also, um, no matter how large the number of topics you are setting, um, there is no, there is always not a guarantee that you will obtain your desired results because. Um, the enterprise topic models really cannot read your mind and um, it doesn't really know what you're like interested in and um, many times um, not to mention the topic models are not stable every time you run it you get different results because um, you're obtaining a local optimal solution from that and also um, you you um, I think in principle there is no guarantee that you you can like uh, run the topic modeling framework for once or twice or some specific times and get your uh, like desired results. And even if you get one, um, that topic might not be uh, completely like um, satisfying your purpose or completely be 
your like perfect choice because on the topic model, sometimes uh, if you look at the topic modeling results, um, you cannot like really give them a very like a specific or very uh, accurate description. Some of uh, most of the times the answer price models, um, as I mentioned, um, they give results that are a mixture of different semantics and they are not dis distinctive enough from each other. Uh, well, our like weekly surprise models are pretty much um, the purpose of making the like results more distinctive and uh, more clear for um, the user to comprehend um, their interested topics. So um, I think if you go back to um, check our like um, slides, maybe page 22 of part three, you can uh, clearly see that um, even if you are trying to pick up some like uh, similar topics closer to your desired ones, it's not really that, uh, it's not really that um, optimal or that perfect. Well, our uh, Kate model almost always like find uh, semantically correlated and accurate uh, terms. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. Okay, so if we do not have further questions, uh, you we we will you know stop uh, our tutorial, uh, ending it right here. Uh, I should thank all the attendees uh, who actually uh, very patient with this online mode. And we, our tutorial uh, lecture, our, all the slides are published on the tutorial webpage, also on Emo's uh, GitHub page. Uh, so Emo's GitHub actually contains lots of open source software uh, covered in this tutorial as well. Okay. So uh, we should thank everyone. So let's uh, finish our tutorial right now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks uh, to you and uh, Jiaxin. You know, it's really great work. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye everyone. Have a nice time. Enjoy this KDD conference.